Honourable members, please be seated. Committee of the Whole. members, I would like to call Committee of the Whole to order. The Committee of the Whole has under consideration Government Amendment A1 in the Alberta Sovereignty Within a United Canada Act. Are there any comments, questions or amendments to be offered with respect to this amendment? I see the Honourable Member for Edmonton City Centre. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the opportunity to rise and speak to the amendment on Bill 1. You know, Mr. Speaker, when I was a kid, my dad had a favorite joke he used to like to tell us. This was one of a couple jokes that he told us that he had learned growing up in Trinidad. This was a joke called Wisdom Pie. So the way it goes is there was a man who didn't have much. He lived on the streets. He was forced to use his wits to survive. So one day he had an idea. He managed to scrape together enough coins, begged, found to get a little bit of butter, flour, and an egg, whipped up a sort of pie crust. He filled that pie crust with a substance that was in, shall we say, copious supply in a nearby cow pasture. He mixed it in with a little bit of cocoa that he found and covered it with a bit of cane sugar, and he baked it over an open fire. And he took that pie, and he went out and knocked on a door in the community. And when the homeowner came to answer, the man declared, hey, this is your lucky day, sir. You have a chance to be the first to try my special recipe, wisdom pie. The homeowner, and the homeowner said, well, oh, wisdom pie, well, what's, what's that? The poor man said, ah, well, it's the most wonderful thing. You know, it's a magical pie. It's made from the freshest natural ingredients. It's guaranteed to give you a tremendous burst of energy to raise your awareness and give you a long memory, and all this from a single bite. Well, the homeowner was impressed. He thought it sounded like a wonderful thing, so he haggled with the seller for a few minutes before they settled on a price for the pie, and the seller quickly hurried off with his money. The homeowner went inside to sample this amazing purchase. He cut a slice and he took a bite. As soon as he tasted what was in that pie, he instantly sat up and ran out the door to chase that seller down. And he found the seller a few streets over and he started giving him a pretty good chewing out, saying, you know, he'd been cruelly tricked. And the seller said, no, 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 not at all. You see, clearly one bite of that pie gave you a tremendous burst of energy that allowed you to run here so quickly. You're clearly far more aware than you were before and I'm sure this is a memory that will last the rest of your life. Mr. Speaker, what we have before us in Bill 1 is a heaping serving of wisdom pie. And the fact is, yes, the bill has been amended, but you know what? No amount of cinnamon and spice and extra sugar changes what is at the heart of this bill. It does not change what is at the heart of that wisdom pie. You know, I think back, Mr. Chair, think back to this spring when I had the honor of introducing a private member's bill. And I remember at that time being told my bill was not worthy of debate, being told that I had not consulted enough. In particular, I had not consulted enough with racialized communities, including indigenous communities. I remember being told by one of the ministers, indeed, the minister of what is essentially now labor, and his comments were, Mr. Speaker, a bill of this nature requires a great deal of consultation, not just from the activist class or from the academic class, but from a wide range of cultural communities. The minister went on to say, rather than taking into consultation different communities, they proposed an unwieldy bill 
It would make it harder for government departments to function. A political football, he called it, Mr. Speaker, and said on that side of the aisle they were not interested in party and foolish politics. That minister, Mr. Chair, has been one of the chief people stumping for this hot mess of a job-killing bill. An embarrassment of an act that did not see a single bit of consultation with Indigenous communities who are owed the duty to consult under treaty rights. This minister stands in favor of that. Mr. Speaker, if my bill was not worthy of debate, then this bill was not even worthy of ever being introduced. Far more thought and care went into that bill than has been spent in any of this bill that we have sent here. This bill is an embarrassment, it is going to be an incredibly damaging to our economy. And the government should be ashamed of ever having brought it into this House. You know, we've been down this road before. Now, if the bill is being amended, and the amendment is removing sweeping powers that this government chose to award to itself. Now, the minister, of course, tried to deny this multiple times on social media, but the fact is, he is now, they are now essentially admitting it is true because they are amending to take it out. Now, of course, this is, just goes to show how little thought, either how little thought the government put into this bill, and that they failed to recognize the incredibly sweeping powers they were giving to themselves and are now amending out of existence, or they intended to do so and just got caught. You know, I think back, Mr. Speaker, this, again, this is a government that has a, it's very fond of awarding itself extraordinary powers. We have another bill in front of this House right now, Bill 4, in which this government is taking back a power that they said, well, when they brought the bill in, Bill 21, they said, well, we're just clarifying a power that we always feel we had. This being a government, Mr. Speaker, that is pretty presumptive. Uh, arrogant, entitled, I think those are appropriate words. Think back to Bill 10, Mr. Speaker. I remember the debate on Bill 10 where they award, try, expanded the powers that they had that were similar to this under the Public Health Act, going even beyond what they've tried to award themselves here in Bill 1, going so far as to allow themselves to create entirely new legislation without ever setting foot in the legislature. Now, at least then, Mr. Speaker, there, or Mr. Chair, that was within the context of a public health emergency. So at least there was some boundaries on it there. As embarrassing as that was, and as much as they, in the end, then had to go and walk that entire thing back, strike an entire legislative committee, spend weeks with multiple MLAs to undo that bit of arrogance that they refused to listen to when we were debating it here in the chamber, and we told them exactly what they were doing. But it blew back on them from their own supporters. Now, what we have in front of us now, we have clearly seen over the last week, is receiving incredible blowback for many in the community, to the point that we are now here debating this amendment to the bill today, an amendment which certainly removes a problematic portion of the bill, but ultimately, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chair, this bill at its core is wisdom pie. There is nothing to redeem here. There is nothing of value in this act. This amendment does not go far enough. The only amendment that would be appropriate would be an amendment that removed every single clause and every single portion of this bill. So speaking back to consultation, Mr. Chair, we saw clearly today that the chiefs from the Assembly of First Nations spoke very clearly about what they think about this bill. And let's be clear, Mr. Chair, the duty to consult is not a duty to appoint someone to maybe go and talk to a few people after you've already introduced the legislation. It is not a duty to say, we'll send someone over to explain that to you because you don't understand what we're talking about. It is not a duty to say, we'll pass the legislation, we'll put it in place, we'll put a little clause in saying, we promise to be nice to you, just trust us. And that's good enough. The duty to consult means that you sit down with dignity and respect with indigenous leaders, with First Nations, 
and you talk to them about what you are thinking of doing or what you are intending to do. You genuinely listen to their feedback in a way that allows them to actually participate in the process before you attempt to move legislation that affects them. This government did none of those things because this government was in such a rush to bring in this flagship bill, it's clear that they barely even sat down and thought it through. They were so desperate to try to fulfill this radical promise of the Premier that she was going to give Alberta the power to never have to listen to anything the federal government ever said again. Mm -hmm. Taken from a cockeyed idea from Alberta separatists, who intentionally wanted to pick a political fight, a constitutional fight, who said, yep, absolutely, this legislation is 100% unconstitutional, and that's the point. So the Premier had to try to find a way in a few short weeks to adapt that hot mess into this hot mess, into something that she could somehow get past all of the leadership candidates who now sit in her cabinet, who spoke out against the very concept and idea of this bill repeatedly, on the record, talked about how destructive it would be for Alberta, how destructive it would be for our economy, the chaos it would cause. So what we have before us, Mr. Speak Mr. Chair, is not a bill that's intended to do things better for Albertans. This is not a bill that is intended to improve our economy. It will not even improve things for our energy industry, Mr. Chair. It is here because it was a campaign promise for this Premier. It is about her political fortunes. It is about this government's intent to play political games in desperate hopes of re-election next May. And you know, again, speaking of that consultation piece, Mr. Chair, as we look at this amendment, as this government tries to make a bad bill better and fails miserably because there is no redeeming it, One of the reasons that we have had so many challenges getting pipelines to Tidewater built is because conservative governments have done such a terrible job on the duty to consult. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that we saw this repeatedly under conservative federal <laughs> governments. We saw that happen with uh, Northern Gateway. It was killed because they tried to do a runaround on the duty to consult. To do it shorthand, find a shortcut, skip their homework, and they got called out by the courts. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Even the Liberal government, when they came in and were working on getting TMX through, even they had to go back and backtrack and make sure they did that consultation. Now, of course, they were having to work on a rather uh, the poor foundation that had been laid before them. But the fact is, it still came down to the only reason that we have a pipeline to tie water that will be in operation next year is because a Liberal government sat down and redid that consultation. Our current mayor here in the city of Edmonton, actually, Mayor Amajit Soe, in his role as the Minister of Natural Resources, sat down and redid that consultation and made sure it was done thoroughly and before the fact, and that got the approval to allow that pipeline to be built. Well, that, of course, in the advocacy of the leader of the official opposition, the MLA for Edmonton Strathcona, mm -hmm. who was relentless in holding the Prime Minister to account to ensure that pipeline was funded and built. And she did it, Mr. Chair, without a grandstanding hot mess of a piece of legislation that threatens to potentially scuttle any further energy infrastructure ever being built for the province of Alberta. So we have here this amendment today, which is removing some of the sweeping powers this government awarded itself. Again, that was certainly the largest concern that was raised, but it's not the only one. And multiple constitutional scholars have spoken out with concerns about it. Now, of course, this government has dug deep and spent days working to find the one in ten dentists that will say that sugar does not cause cavities. 
They've managed to find a handful of those, but we know the vast majority of constitutional scholars, lawyers, individuals have spoken out and said, what we are saying, this bill is a hot mess. It's something that never should have seen the light of day in the legislature, and it's something that will cause untold headaches and costs for Albertans and potential damage to our economy. In the words of Ian Holloway, Dean of the Law School at the University of Calgary, if I was grading one of my first-year law students on the actual writing of the bill, I'd give them a C- minus at best. It's so poorly drafted, so riddled with internal contradictions, it's trying to thread a needle It's very hard to be threaded. To my mind, this is about as clearly an unconstitutional gambit as I have ever seen in my professional lifetime. The Premier is engaging in a game of political chicken. This is not really about asserting greater sovereignty for Alberta, but rather winning the election and goading the federal government into saying or doing something intemperate. And Mr. Chair, this is what this government makes its bill one. It's what it's obsessed with. It is what it's pouring all its energy into at a time when we have real problems here in the province of Alberta. Mm -hmm. A health care crisis. A health care crisis for children, Mr. Chair. On that, this Premier has next to nothing to say other than perhaps we'll get you some Tylenol in four to six weeks. But they have all the time in the world, all the power, all the resources to pour into this hot mess, mm -hmm. this steaming wisdom pie. Even with removing the sweeping powers with the government awarded itself in this bill and then attempted to say it was not, in fact, actually awarding itself and then said, well, maybe, and then said, oh, oops, sorry, we'll pull that out. Even without that, there are several legal problems that remain that make it very likely that this bill is utterly unconstitutional, mm -hmm. including trying to award powers to the legislature which belong to the courts. Now, I find that incredibly presumptive, Mr. Chair. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a constitutional scholar. I do not believe I have the personal ability as an elected legislator to determine what is and is not constitutional. Mm -hmm. Neither does any member on that side of the House or this side of the House, even those that are lawyers, do not have that ability. Now, each of us may have an opinion. Certainly, we're all allowed to have one of those. You know what the saying is, everybody has, everyone has an opinion. <laughs> but that is far, far different, Mr. Chair, than saying our opinion should carry the weight of the rule of law. Now, of course, we as legislators are given enormous power to indeed introduce, debate, and to pass laws. And for that, there is no requirement, there is no IQ test, there is no experience requirement, because, of course, we want people of all experience, knowledge, skill sets to have the opportunity to represent the people of this province. But it is a far, far different thing, Mr. Chair to say that anyone elected to this legislature has the skill, the knowledge, to be able to determine at the same level as our Supreme Court what is constitutional, or that they should. Now, I get it. You can feel really, it can be really frustrating, really aggravating when someone else does something you don't like. It can be absolutely frustrating when you feel you do not have the power to retaliate or that the, the means of, I guess, pushing back take time, take effort, that you can't have instant satisfaction. But that is simply the reality of life, Mr. Chair. That is what it means to be an adult. We have a system in place 
if there is an issue of constitutionality, if we question whether or not something is constitutional, then we go to the courts. And the folks that are appointed to do that work, who have decades, in some cases, of experience, knowledge, training in making these, a group of them together will make that determination. What we have here is a government that is insisting they have the right to throw a temper tantrum when something happens they don't like. That because they don't like the way, they don't like the time it would take to go through the courts. And let's be clear, Mr. Chair, this is a government that is happy to put that burden on other people. This is not a government that's been ashamed to trample on potentially labor rights and say, hey, if you don't like what we did, go to the court. In the meantime, we're going to do what we like. They certainly weren't ashamed to do that in terms of taking away, again, with, we were debating members, before. Members, any other members looking to add? I see the Honorable Member for Edmonton North. North. West. Yes. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate the uh, acknowledgement and the chance to speak on the amendment to, to, to Bill 1. <clears throat> and just a couple of things that occurred to me when we saw this introduced last night. First of all, I was astonished to see, uh, Mr. Chair, that this um, amendment was almost half the size of the entire act, right? Very similar um, amount of rhetoric and talk, right, uh, legalese and so forth, and similarly jumbled and well paired with the original act as it was brought, or bill brought forward to us in uh, its contradictions and it's sort of vague associations from one thing to another. And so again, when we're looking for clues, like Sherlock Holmes, to, to see how this whole thing was made up, we can see that it's been very haphazard and sort of glued together in uh, the very quickest sort of way um, to satisfy some kind of need for, um, I don't know, internal problems that the UCP government might have or internal problems within their caucus, whatever. But here it is foisted upon the people of Alberta. We have to deal with this here in the legislature. And you know, I've learned over the years as a legislator that and I, you only really have two most valuable commodities available to you. You have time, and the time is rapidly ticking down on this government, I can tell you, right? And it's slipping away to a matter of months to do something effective to deal with what Albertans actually want their government to deal with at this moment, this juncture in history, a 40-year high you know, uh, unaffordable cost of living in all sort of ways possible, uh, a public health system that is not there when you need it for yourself and your family, right? And all of the insecurity that is associated with those two immediate emergencies that need to be dealt with. And here we are, burning time, right, the very limited time that this government has left, discussing something that really needs to be dealt with in other ways. Yes, of course a government has to step up to Ottawa. I mean, provinces do it all the time. It's an important thing. We did it as government, and we will continue to do so again when we form the government again. But to put up these half-baked bills, right, they're more like a call to arms to, uh, I don't know what, um, uh, some fringe group of uh, our society, is, is a terrible waste of time. Yeah. The other thing, the other commodity that we have, I believe, as legislators, again, this government's burning it through it like, <laughs> you know, um, gambling in Las Vegas, is uh, integrity. If people don't believe that your integrity is intact and that you're serving the people of this province, then it doesn't matter what you bring forward. Once your integrity is gone, they simply won't believe you. So this is a huge dose of integrity compromise, Bill 1. And this um, amendment does nothing to fix that. It, looks, it feels like you know, you're, you're trying to bail out the boat with a, with a, a cup somehow, right? And, and it just keeps on getting worse. And it's just not working. working. Yes, indeed. So I have categorical problems, I've said it before, right, of the very existence of a Sovereignty Act being brought forward into this legislature. Those very words 
cause turmoil. They cause issues around uh, integrity, of course, but also around people just not sure what's going to happen next, right? The implications and the responsibility of this provincial body extend to post-secondary institutions, to non-profits, to all of the associations we have with federal government and the funding of important programs that uh, we are responsible for. It puts all of those things into question. People have to sort of say, okay, are they going to bring forward some sovereignty tribunal to look and see whether they should build that affordable housing in Lethbridge or should they, you know, think twice? It, it, it just, it's, it's not governance. It's just somehow subverting the whole notion of governance. And people don't like it, right? I mean, maybe, sure, they say, oh, you know, Ottawa's uh, encroaching on our, uh, our, our province, and, uh, you know, sometimes we have a right to think that, for sure, and we need to fight back on it. But this is not fighting back. This is a lazy way by which to make people angry or try to make people angry, but you know what? They're getting angry for the wrong reasons. They're not getting angry about this the issue of, of, of Ottawa. They're getting angry with the government not doing their job. That's what they're angry about. So, you know, I always am happy to give free advice, and uh, my advice to this government now is to pull back on this now. We can see in Saskatchewan they're doing the same thing, right? They're, whatever, Saskatchewan First Act, or whatever, is, um, you know, not even uh, in the same league as this one in terms of uh, offensive uh, breaches of constitutionality and so forth. And, it, you know, their watered-down version of Elf in Saskatchewan first, they're backing off on it, right? They're saying, well, we can't, we, maybe we're not going to do this right now because they can see similar uh, um, um, backlash from uh, groups like it's just happening here in, uh, in Alberta. Right? The um, AFN, for example, um, <clears throat> for, for, for Assembly of First Nations, spoke out in the most clear terms possible that this Bill 1, Sovereignty Act, and Saskatchewan First Act, need to be dumped immediately. That they do not, they're illegal, they, they breach the um, uh, terms of uh, treaties uh, across this country, and in Alberta and Saskatchewan specifically, and uh, they are ins it's an insult, quite frankly, to the premise of uh, treaties and the agreements uh, signed therein. Um, we know that uh, investors are shaken by this as well. And we know that all of the institutions that are um, under the purview of this uh, provincial body are also shaken and wondering as well. They're coming to me from the post-secondary sector. They're saying, okay, what on earth can they overrule? Are they going to overrule on research? Are they going to overrule on expansion? Are they going to determine, um, you know, what we have to teach and uh, otherwise uh, pull back on those things? In some ways, I think that this UCP government has been practicing for the Sovereignty Act over the last three and a half years, right? With all of these uh, leaving money on the table with the federal government, um, uh, dictating uh, which uh, courses need to be taught at post-secondary institutions, um, you know, backing off on so many promises and responsibilities. It almost feels like it's just been kind of a warm-up to this, uh, this, uh, this bill that we have before us today. Um, so certainly, um, uh, or Mr. Chair, that um, I believe that this um, <clears throat> amendment that has been brought forward, again, is equal only in the sense that it is equally as incompetent as the original bill that we have been given a few days ago. You know, um, just as a, one more, a couple of words, I mean, I certainly will speak on it again, but I mean, it just seems to so, show a, 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 a lack of understanding of uh, the separation of powers, and it makes uh, the legislative body and the cabinet um, judge, jury, and executioner for a whole range of initiatives that we need to deal with in the normal way of, that the Westminster system uh, does uh, lay out over a period of 120 years here and probably 400 years in, uh, throughout the world. Um, so with that, I'll leave it. Um, and, you know, uh, the committee is a good chance for us to uh, have uh, different speakers in different circumstances, and I'm, I'm glad to uh, continue the debate here this evening. Other members wishing to add to debate tonight? I see the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. 
Well, thank you mu very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm pleased to be able to uh, rise to speak um, on this matter in Committee of the Whole um, and, and to speak uh, as well about the, uh, the relevance, the impact, the import of the uh, amendments uh, to Bill 1 that are being put forward uh, by uh, this government. Let me start uh, from the uh, overarching position to just review relatively quickly why it is this act as a whole is a bad idea and why as a whole it is quite unfixable. In essence, this act, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, generates uh, unprecedented amounts of uncertainty uh, in the province uh, relative to, in essence, the rule of law. And uh, it does so in a way that undermines investor certainty, not only here in Alberta, but outside of Alberta, in the rest of Canada, and indeed outside of Canada amongst investors uh, internationally. Um, and it does th so through a number of different means, uh, Mr. Chair. First of all, quite honestly, uh, the whole rollout of this Premier's uh, flagship bill is, a, is, is a, a lesson in legislative incompetence. Uh, we had a Premier uh, uh, introduce the bill on, uh, on throne speech day, and, and within an hour or so, we'd all had a chance to look at it, and we understood that this uh, Premier was attempting to take for herself unprecedented anti-democratic powers uh, in a broad-ranging way, outside of an emergency, in a way that we'd never seen in a proposed uh, piece of legislation in the province of Alberta before. And then we had the Premier and various and sundry agents of the Premier insist that what the bill said was not what the bill said. <laughs> and they claimed we hadn't read the bill, Mr. Chair, and they claimed we didn't understand the bill, Mr. Chair, and they claimed uh, that it didn't say what it said. And so that was very surprising, Mr. Chair, because it became increasingly clear to, to those Albertans who really pay attention to these things that the Premier herself had either not written, or sorry, not read her own bill, or alternatively, was incredibly poorly briefed on her bill, which makes us question the, the, the capacity of the folks who are around her, or actually did know what was in the bill and was just deciding to say something else. And that in and of itself is deeply troubling. So that whole drama, for lack of a better term, around the, the impact of the King Henry VIII clause, what it meant, the fact that it was there, leading up until to last night when the government finally introduced uh, an amendment which we are discussing today that in part included uh, the elimination of that clause, um, does not generate confidence in no way, shape or form. Um, and I've heard that from, from so many folks across the province over the course of the last seven days. They truly worry about who is at the helm and what they know about the job they've been asked to do by the 1% of the population that selected the Premier to lead the government caucus uh, last month. And so that display in and of itself drives a tremendously a deep level of uncertainty um, across this province. Now, there are also, of course, things in the legislation that uh, uh, create a tremendous amount of uh, a lack of clarity. This whole issue of, of who it is the government can direct, um, the language around uh, um, anyone with a, a fiscal relationship with, with the government. Uh, it's actually not clear to us how far and deep into the uh, private sector the government would purport to go uh, with this bill. So once again, of course, that creates a lack of clarity. Um, the consequences of this government declaring that uh, uh, federal laws are not applicable or not enforceable here in Alberta, that of course creates a tremendous lack of just clarity in terms of what the bill is intended to do. Then, of course, uncertainty also is driven by the, the likely unconstitutionality 
of uh, elements of this legislation and the member from uh, uh, Edmonton Centre as well as the member from Edmonton Northwest were just outlining those those points again uh, today uh, even. And uh, I will say, and I'll talk in just a moment, there is nothing in these amendments that appear to undo the primary concerns around the constitutionality of this piece of legislation. And then finally, it is very clear to us that we have a very, very serious problem uh, embedded within this legislation as it relates to treaty rights uh, in, this in this province. And uh, that uh, also creates a tremendous amount of uncertainty. Now, Mr. Chair, this is not me sitting around coming up with fun, exciting ways to uh, suggest that this bill creates uncertainty. This is me listening to Albertans. We have heard uh, from uh, the head of CAP that uh, any bill that creates uncertainty for investors is a bill that is a bad idea for the province. We have heard from the Calgary Chamber of Commerce that this bill uh, creates um, uncertainty for many members, a range of members within the Calgary Chamber of Commerce. And I understand the Premier likes to talk about those anonymous folks who allegedly called her one day and said that they don't agree with the uh, um, uh, head of the chamber. But I will say that, uh, you know, we dispatched three of our MLAs to go to a chamber function a couple of days ago, and they spoke to a multiplicity of chamber members at that function. And actually, they all kind of agreed with the um, uh, head of the Calgary Chamber of Commerce uh, and said, yeah, no, this is uh, very, very concerning, and it creates a lot of economic and investor uncertainty. They spoke actually to investors, in fact. Um, we also heard from the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, who also said that this bill creates tremendous uh, economic uncertainty. And then today we were pleased to uh, stand with a former governor of the Bank of Canada, David Dodge, who outlined in, in great detail uh, the means through which uh, this legislation created uncertainty, essentially saying that the, the uh, incompatibility of this legislation with provincial and federal laws and the inability of international investors to predict which laws would apply to the investment that they might or might not make would inevitably lead to those folks choosing other jurisdictions and that that was a huge problem because we are in a place right now where everybody is competing for international investment dollars and we are only one jurisdiction and we are doing the exact opposite of delivering a message that this is the place where those dollars should come. So that came from uh, the former Bank of Canada Governor David Dodge, someone who just to review served under former uh, Prime Minister Stephen Harper. Mm -hmm. So the final problem with this bill as a whole, of course, and it has again been touched on by other members of my caucus, is that it is uh, to a large degree diverting this government's attention from the issues that actually do matter to Albertans. And there have been now uh, multiple polls that have been both publicly and, and quietly published on this issue. And I know members opposite get access to some of those private, non-published polls that we do that, that reinforce the fact that this is absolutely not what the people of this province want to hear their government talking about right now. And uh, yet that's what they are doing. And what does that mean? Well, it means that in the midst of the probably single most damaging uh, flu, COVID, RSV epidemic impacting children in uh, d decades in this province, um, we have a premier who on one hand is unwilling to stand and recommend that children get the flu vaccine, and on the other hand, was unable to answer the question I asked her yesterday about the resignation of the two deputy chief medical officers of health. Why? Probably because she was spending so much time trying, trying to finally understand what the bill she had introduced meant after she finally decided to read it. But the point is, is that what she wasn't doing was finding out or being briefed on the fact that we actually have the top three public health positions in this province right now are vacant. 
I mean, yeah, we have someone who's theoretically called the Chief Medical Officer of Health, but he's got a full-time job already. <laughs> and so really, he's doing this literally off the side of his desk without an extra cent. So he's a volunteer, and then now <coughs> the other two positions, ha we have resignations with both of them. And we have a Premier who apparently didn't know that that was happening at a time when our emergency rooms are overwhelmed with far too many children um, uh, desperate for medical care. So that's what happens when the government is diverted from the issues they should be dealing with. So now we have a government that has introduced amendments. And let me be perfectly clear about the consequences of these amendments. I will say on the first matter, no question, the amendments now effectively eliminate the Henry VIII Clause. It now clarifies that we are no longer dealing with statutes, pieces of legislation, but rather we are dealing with regulations, and that is fine, that is good, good step forward. I don't know why we needed to be subjected to so much uh, arrogant insult, insults from the Premier. I wish on the first day when we had pointed out what she had done that she would have risen, apologized, thanked us for pointing out the mistake, and just indicated right then that she would fix it. But no, apparently we've not quite learned the lessons she claims to have learned from former Premier Ralph Klein. Nonetheless, so that's the first thing that this amendment does, and that is good. It does not, however, for all the reasons I've just outlined, uh, address the much bigger problems uh, embedded in this bill. The second thing that this amendment does is it attempts to limit the uh, lack of clarity in one element of the bill by more directly defining what amounts to harmful. And I thought what they had done, actually, when I first heard about uh, these amendments, uh, Mr. Chair, what I actually thought they'd done was actually eliminated reference to harmful altogether and otherwise just said, you know, this will just be um, uh, a matter that is brought before the House when, in the opinion of the House, uh, we think there, that there's been a, um, a, a, an unconstitutional act on the part of the federal government. But no, it turns out, no, that's actually not what they did. They didn't actually even do that either. They kept the possibility of passing a resolution uh, if it is harmful. And then they went on to say, and har harmful means that the range of actions that are covered by this uh, piece of legislation um, that the federal government may take affect something that's in provincial jurisdiction. That's all that has to happen. Then it's harmful. It affects it. That's what the legislation says. Just want you to be clear. It doesn't have to hurt something that's in provincial jurisdiction. It doesn't have to diminish something that's in provincial jurisdiction. It just needs to affect it. Yeah. And if it affects something that's in provincial jurisdiction, then it is officially harmful. Let's walk down the list of things that, that would fall under that definition, Mr. Chair. Well, we had a very um, good news announcement on the part of the government a little over a month ago in the industrial heartland where uh, a new project, $1.2, $1.3 billion, was announced uh, by Air Products. And that particular project, uh, excellent project, is a project uh, focused on, uh, on developing hydrogen, uh, reducing emissions while still um, um, taking advantage of our uh, energy resources here. Very good project. And in that project, I think it was about 1.2, so 1.2, 1.4 billion dollars. Uh, 140 million dollars was committed uh, by the provincial government through what is now the uh, successor to our original PDP program. And 300 million was uh, committed by the federal government. Well, pretty sure that amounts to an initiative on the part of the federal government that affects a matter that is within provincial jurisdiction. Yep, sure does. It does, Mr. Chair. But that is how they have changed the definition to include harmful or to be harmful. So in fact, they've not limited the scope of this word harmful at all. Uh, and in fact, it still, in fact, could even relate to things that the Premier has, has uh, articulated her extreme displeasure with, um, like, for instance, the billions of dollars that the provincial government is receiving in order to support uh, young families across this province through finally bringing in a robust child care program. So, this second amendment then, Mr. Chair, 
does nothing to effectively limit the definition of harmful, and it does not eliminate the provision which actually is at the heart of what is uh, one of the two most unconstitutional elements of this bill, which is uh, the belief that the legislature can step into the shoes of the courts and make a determination about the constitutionality of a federal action or a federal initiative or a federal act. And as a result of that still being in there, they have not actually touched in one bit, well not by one iota, the most offending part of this legislation as it relates to that particular head of unconstitutionality. So there is no change here. They still allow themselves the ability to, to uh, make a motion that says in the brilliant opinion of this uh, UCP majority government, the folks who literally spent seven days telling us that what was written in their bill was not written in their bill, that uh, with their brilliant guidance, we're going to uh, determine what is now unconstitutional on the part of the federal government, and then we're gonna do a range of things that we don't really describe to a range of people who we can't really identify. <laughs> so, it's this kind of thing, Mr. Chair, that says, drives investors to say, yeah, you know, I could open my uh, tech company or my digital media company in Calgary, or I could just go to BC where they're a little less close to the edge of the, diving into, off the deep end, uh, and where I've got a better sense of what the laws are. That, I'm afraid, is what one of the consequences of this horrible piece of legislation is gonna be. Now, the other thing that is critically important about this bill, and the reason why it must be rejected out of hand, which is completely unaffected by the amendments brought forward today, uh, by, uh, or last night, uh, in, the dark, in the dark of night, uh, by this government, is the fact that we do not address the fundamentally flawed approach taken by this government when it comes to addressing the rights of indigenous people in this province. We have a legal obligation to acknowledge treaty rights. That's not done here. We have a moral obligation to pursue genuine reconciliation, by refusing to speak to a single one of the Grand Chiefs of the treaties here in Alberta, the Premier has failed to demonstrate any modicum of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. By repeatedly claiming that she has one person that she's spoken to, and then at the same time failing to apologize for the fact that her minister claimed to have spoken to the actual representatives of the treaties, failing to apologize for the fact that he claimed to do that when he had not. That is the opposite of reconciliation. And finally, this government also has a practical obligation to acknowledge the treaty rights of Indigenous people because that is the only way you can actually build a genuine partnership in economic growth and development. Acknowledging treaty rights and pursuing reconciliation does not mean that you say to indigenous Albertans, we'll give you this one-time opportunity to partner with us on this one economic deal that we picked. That is not reconciliation. That is not treaty rights. They have an opportunity to partner, yes, but they have a right to choose not to and instead to ask that they be treated as the treaty leaders that they are, and this government failed to do that. So they have now picked a fight with um, uh, indigenous leaders and treaty chiefs across this country, and they have injected a higher level of instability, legal instability, into our whole regulatory regime than had existed for years. So they have really messed this up, Mr. Mr. Chair. And the fact of the matter is, is that it's not at all touched on by the amendments. And to pursue the objective of passing this legislation today, tonight, tomorrow,
without pulling back and engaging in meaningful consultation is to ensure that this will be challenged in moments and that it will be found to be unconstitutional and is to absolutely torch the critically important nation-to-nation -nation relationship that should exist between this premier and between the leaders of, of, um, of, the, tr of the treaties. All right. Other members, welcome to. Other members looking to add to debate tonight? I see the Honourable Member for Lethbridge West. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I, I rise to speak uh, to the amendment on Bill 1, uh, the uh, hot max express that is Bill 1. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, I'm going to uh, speak first about uh, the separation of powers a little bit and uh, usurping of the role of the courts, which is what this legislation does and the amendment says not touch. Uh, and um, then I would like to make a few comments about uh, the democratic implications of such a project um, and uh, uh, the bad faith uh, uh, conduct, uh, essentially, that is characterized by both the introduction of this bill, uh, the amendment process, and ultimately uh, this, um, uh, uh, the time allocation and so on of this bill. Uh, why is this happening <laughs> right now? Why does this uh, legislation take the form that it does? Uh, I would argue that uh, this is happening by design of a usurping and, uh, of the role of the courts and a politicization of the courts by uh, at certain elements of the far right uh, who have now adhered themselves to the UCP uh, uh, electoral coalition uh, and uh, uh, have made uh, themselves uh, uh, much more prominent by the election of this particular leader. Uh, this bill, uh, when one looks at the Free Alberta strategy, uh, uh, one can just read uh, uh, what they have said, which is uh, the federally appointed judges are accused in that strategy of, quote, blatant judicial activism and bias against the constitutionally enshrined jurisdictional rights of Alberta, which is, I guess, an odd thing to say about a Supreme Court that uh, remains uh, majority appointed by uh, uh, Stephen Harper. Um, but uh, uh, here we are. The fact of the matter is, is that this bill has its provenance out of a wing of uh, uh, the conservative movement that has become more prominent, that has in fact taken over the conservative movement in this country, and that has no regard for the rule of law, for the separation of powers, uh, and for our institutions of liberal democracy. In fact, it is sui generis to this movement that they undermine those aspects of what makes for a good life for all of us at every available turn. And so here in this bill, and uh, 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 the leader of the official opposition just spoke uh, to many of its, its implications in terms of investment and so on. I want to uh, I, I do something that probably she wishes that uh, she could do because I, I know her well enough by now, which is I'm going to get into a little bit of detail about uh, <laughs> separation of powers. Let's uh, uh, buckle up here. Um, it, it, one of the core functions of any liberal democracy and any place that grounds itself in the rule of law is that the judiciary uh, is independent. And in Canada, of course, of course, it's not just judicial independence for the uh, purposes of, of uh, uh, staying away from the sort of feckless and reckless uh, uh, flightiness of elected legislatures. No, it's also intimately bound up in the, con uh, in the concept of jurisdiction since Confederation. And so the court's concerns for protecting uh, uh, that independence uh, is not just to protect us all from, uh, from uh, uh, decisions that might target one group of individuals or one uh, a region or so on and, and upset the balance in that way, that balance of our own individual security, the person, various collective rights. It also has to do with intrusion from provincial legislatures over the years uh, uh, into the, the levels of, of uh, uh, the federal judiciary. And, there's, and uh, uh, Banks and Olzinski, uh, which uh, uh, my friend from uh, uh, Edmonton Rutherford uh, tabled uh, earlier this afternoon, uh, go into some detail on this, that uh, 
Uh, and so I'll quote from it. Grounded in the judicature provisions of the Constitution Act 1867, and just as, you know, to open a bracket here, we've heard the Premier variously, um, um, you know, go on and on about the founders as if we live in America and uh, uh, the, the uh, integrity of our foundational documents, which is, of course, the Constitution Act of 1982 brought in by Pierre Trudeau, but she overlooks uh, that because it, the rhetorical flourish makes, I guess, her uh, uh, feel better about what she's about to do. Um, but uh, both legislative and executive bodies are incapable of intruding upon the core jurisdiction of superior courts or infringing upon the independence of the judiciary. One of the reasons for this is, of course, that concern of federalism, which is always integral to everything that we do uh, uh, in this um, um, a giant place we uh, often call a country. Uh, but it's also because then it avoids the um, uh, uh, development of a shadow court system, a parallel court system. That is to say there is only one place where decisions get made. So for example, if you are the parent of two teenage boys, there is only one place where the decisions get made and that is mom. <laughs> um, in a, 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 a liberal democracy, there is only one uh, a place where the, those decisions get made in a final instance and that is the courts. You can't go around making yourself a, a parallel system uh, of justice. That doesn't work for anyone. The rules apply to everyone and they apply in the same way and that's how they protect us all. And that's the entire jurisprudence of what's called Section 96 of the Constitution. Uh, and uh, uh, there are a number of Supreme Court decisions laying out all of the various uh, ins and outs of this. And uh, uh, one of those um, um, decisions was in fact uh, uh, around the uh, uh, one of the uh, Supreme Court justices writing for, in fact, the dissent uh, in the, uh, the carbon tax reference, uh, wherein uh, Suzanne Cote wrote um, that uh, uh, the, um, the infringing upon the independence of the judiciary includes the duty to maintain the rule of law, protects citizens from arbitrary action by supervising <coughs> state action. That is to say, there is a final arbiter on any capriciousness that may come out of a legislature, as we are seeing right now. Now, Bill 1 may not remove a court uh, jurisdiction, as Banks and Olszewski write, from a Section 96 court. What they do is it contemplates the creation of a parallel court. Because in this legislature, apparently, we will decide what is constitutional and what is not. And the entire Bill 1 then derives from that original trigger. Um, I would argue that this attack on the judiciary, as I uh, quoted that uh, so-called free Alberta strategy, uh, is in fact a feature and not a bug. This is of a piece of the entire, it's not even an ideology, it is a grab bag of, of ideas, but insofar as it is an ideology, it involves the attack on uh, uh, collective knowledge, on the rule of law, on liberal democratic institutions, and ultimately on trust which is what our entire system runs on. From property rights to security of the person to traffic laws, our entire system runs on trust. This is of a piece, and you know that because all you have to do is listen to this premier. She has variously attacked science, public health, our national security establishment. Oh, just asking questions about Ukraine. You know, uh, flood mitigation, amnesty for people who broke the law. That's not a thing in Canada, just so that we're all clear. Um, so she's just asking questions, just kicking down the foundations of everything that has led to the longevity, equality, individual liberties, protected us from reckless or feckless decisions by those in power that protect our security, the person, our Section 7 charter rights, our property uh, rights, all of it. This is, too, an attack on every aspect of civil society. That amount remains unamended in this legislation. How do you know that? You look at Section 1 of this bill. This is not a war with Ottawa. This is going to war with ourselves. It disrupts the activities of nonprofits, crown agencies, housing authorities, municipalities, delegated authorities, police services. No wonder it's so deeply unpopular. That's just the politics of it, not even the constitutionality of it. I asked one of my friends uh, the other day, he's a senior lawyer in uh, at Calgary, corporate and commercial, I said, what do you think about this thing? He said, it's ridiculous and it makes us look ridiculous. <laughs> I asked uh, I, another friend of mine, a businessman in uh, uh, Calgary, I said, what do you think about this? And he said, don't worry, May is coming and that's how we'll deal with it. So, you know, I guess ultimately, 
on the one, on the one hand, this is very bad for democracy, and I will use a, a, a quote to talk about that uh, from a member from across the way. Quote, to present to Albertans in any way that there is some magical solution that the legislature could pass tomorrow that would somehow make all these problems, that is to say FedProv relations, go away is not factual. That person also suggested the sovereignty bill would not only lead to uncertainty for business investment, but also foster bad blood with party members and voters by promising something that can't be fulfilled. Quote, the number one way to make Albertans mad at us would be to promise that you can do things with certain legislation that you cannot do and then not deliver. That will make them very upset. Like that's almost happened before. So I would caution anyone who wants to lead uh, the UCP to make sure they have all their ducks in a row. And uh, that uh, a person also went on to say, I would be surprised if a bill as described would pass inside the legislature. It would be call, uh, calling for the breaking of the law, which is just not something the legislature would do. <laughs> well, maybe uh, not that member, the member for Rimby Rocky Mountain House Sundry, who said those words uh, during the campaign, but uh, certainly, um, apparently the legislature will do it and everyone will just get in line. The proposal uh, uh, is no different, by the way. What uh, uh, those members were responding to and was actually put before us, there is no difference. So ultimately, this is bad for democracy in the ways that the member for Rimby Rocky Mountain House Centre, and I cannot believe I am saying this, I agree with him, uh, uh, describes here. Yeah, 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 everybody just hold on. <laughs> Um, because the fact of the matter is, it does make people mad to promise something that you can't deliver. And that is exactly what this has happened, to try to do some sort of trickery to people that is bad for democracy, and that is what's happening here. But I guess in terms of, I will go back to uh, the feedback that I heard from many other people, which is, you know, democracy will speak in me. And uh, uh, if the uh, publicly available uh, uh, data set uh, uh, that was, uh, folks were in the field from uh, Leger between November 24th and 28th as anything to go by uh, before the, the bill was introduced to much uh, uh, hue and cry and excoriation everywhere, um, I, I, I think that uh, uh, the numbers will only be reduced uh, at that time. Uh, uh, but uh, here we are, statistically insignificant uh, difference between voters in Edmonton and Calgary at over 60%, both of them uh, disagreeing with this uh, uh, bill. Um, there is no question that the amendment, or set of amendments, or whatever this several pages is, does not save the fundamental unconstitutionality of this bill. It does not save the overpromising uh, uh, by the Premier. It does not save the, uh, uh, the fact that this is just a continuation of, of grievance politics uh, by a fringe of the far right that has now adhered itself to the Conservative movement in this province. There is no question that this bill uh, uh, remains a fundamental uh, attack on institutions and groups of people and decision makers within the boundaries of Alberta, not outside. Ottawa is unmoved by this particular appearance of clown shoes on the floor of the Alberta legislature. However, municipalities, crown agencies, uh, any uh, contracted service uh, uh, provider, they are not unmoved. They are nervous. They are, uh, have a lot of questions about the priorities of this government. They uh, uh, have not obviously been listened to as the uh, uh, honorable uh, leader of the official opposition uh, uh, has gone on, uh, uh, described at some length in terms of uh, treaty rights. And I think uh, uh, Albertans are noticing just what a devastating error this was, uh, both an error in judgment, an error of priorities, an error in law. Uh, uh, that this bill uh, uh, is and remains with the uh, introduction of the amendment. I will conclude uh, with one observation, which is uh, uh, there is a continuing sort of insistence uh, from the government side uh, uh, within the context of this amendment, but of course uh, within the bill itself as well, that, oh, well, we said that we're not doing anything illegal uh, and we won't do anything unconstitutional, and so therefore it's not. This is, so this is the equivalent, and I think it was my, uh, uh, my very erudite friend from Calgary Mountain View who uh, said this, that this is the equivalent of driving down the highway at 200 kilometers an hour and saying, I'm not breaking the law. 
Oh, well, now we have the amendment. We got rid of the uh, Henry VIII clause. So now we're driving down the highway at 190 kilometers an hour saying the same thing. <laughs> the bill, it doesn't matter that you say, oh, it's not unconstitutional, when then it goes on to detail a number of ways uh, in which it is unconstitutional. It does not save it. It, do it matters what the bill actually does, <laughs> just as in this life. It matters what you do uh, I, a little more than what you say. Uh, and what this bill does is distract us fundamentally from the really um, pressing concerns of our time. We face 40-year high, in, uh, uh, high inflation. We just had another rate hike from the Bank of Canada. This is going to profoundly affect people's bottom line right before Christmas and, and afterwards. We are going into a, a global recession, but we don't know what that means for, for price of oil and so on and all of the geopolitical instability, the uh, uh, European Union's uh, uh, price cap on Russian oil and, and uh, how that, or if that is going to make any difference to global oil markets, given as it is, it's not a question of supply or demand, but how, whether Lloyds of London actually insures tankers and, and they won't over 60 bucks a barrel and it's all very complicated. Um, <laughs> as, uh, uh, and so we don't know what the future holds. And Albertans are feeling that uncertainty and all of those, you know, headlines that swirl in the business news and uh, uh, in the reporting out of Russia and Ukraine and so on. What we know <laughs> is uh, that life is getting more complicated, that people have been to hell and back, many people have during the pandemic, through jobs and health and kids being home and all of these challenges. Uh, they feel like they are bearing down on us. And what is our government doing? I mean, you can't even explain it to people. There's not even, like, people say to you, like, what is happening over there? Just say, oh, never mind. <laughs> um, you, you know, like, tell me about uh, your um, concerns about health care, about affordability, about uh, uh, economic development. Tell me about your ideas, because I cannot even, you know, do you have a half an hour to go through the days of our lives of this particular bill? <laughs> it's, uh, it is so far removed from ordinary people's lives. And all they see is once again, we're into you know, year three plus of this, people just focused, a government that should be just focused on the, just the doing, the business of healthcare and education, social services, all that's hard enough, folks. You can just stick to your knitting and do the hard things because running those systems is a big deal and it matters to people. We have a government who won't, won't do that. They just are wandering around all the time looking at their own drama, focused on themselves, talking about their own jobs instead of people's jobs, talking about you know, their own weird ideas about healthcare rather than what we know in public health matters and what people are looking for and what I, I, doctors and experts and others are telling us. So it is for that reason that, I mean, amend away this hot mess express as I, uh, I began my comments. Uh, it does not save it unless this bill is entirely pulled. Pass as many motions as you like, as, you know, government motions saying mean things about various, you know, people outside of uh, uh, the legislature. If that's what you, how you want to spend your time, that's also fine. That is completely within uh, our uh, uh, role as, as legislators, you know. Uh, and when it comes time to really stand up to Ottawa, do that to also completely within the ambit of this uh, uh, legislature. It's been done on both sides of the House. But ultimately, what needs to happen is this bill needs to be pulled because it is not an appropriate signal to anyone that government is working for them, that democracy can actually solve problems in their lives, that our liberal democratic institutions matter, that the rule of law matters, and within that, the separation of powers matters, the treaty rights matter, Section 35 of the Constitution matters. Let's focus on that, the really hard stuff, which is healthcare, education, keeping people healthy, helping, you know, as I always say, the people's money is for little babies and old people. Let's focus on the really, really hard stuff, the important stuff that people are asking us to do not this stuff that undermines the fabric of who we are and goes to war with our own uh, uh, institutions and, and our own um, ways of making sure that we are building a good life for all Albertans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that we rise and report progress on Bill 1. 
Having heard the motion, does the House concur? Does the Assembly, does the assembly concur? Does the committee. Sorry, does the committee concur? All those in favour say aye. Opposed? Carried. Speaker, the Committee of the Whole has had under consideration a certain bill. The Committee reports progress on the following bill. Bill 1. Does the Assembly concur on the report? All those in favour say aye. aye. Opposed? And so ordered. Under Government Motions, Government Motion 14, the Honourable Mr. Scow. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Speaker, rather, um, I rise to move Government Motion 14 on the order paper, and it reads as follows. Be it resolved that when further consideration of Bill 1, Alberta sovereignty within a United Canada Act is resumed, not more than one hour shall be allotted to any further consideration of the bill in Committee of the Whole, at which time every question necessary for the disposal of the bill at this stage shall be put forthwith. Now, Mr. Speaker, I rose in this House uh, earlier this week to share how much time and effort has been put into this bill, this fall session. And I now rise again to highlight once again the fact that the opposition members continue to filibuster a bill that they made amply clear that they had no interest in even seeing printed, didn't want Albertans to see the bill. As a reminder, Mr. Speaker, the official opposition also made it abundantly clear they had no interest in reading the bill before they voted against it. Members of the opposition have decided to prolong the legislative process on Bill 1, continuing debate over 14 hours. How much time do they really need to announce, um, or rather, sorry, how much time do they need when they already announced that they would not support any amendments that the government put forward? So, if the opposition has no amendments to put forward in Committee of the Whole, then we are going to stop wasting the time of the Assembly and move on the, with the people's business of the province. Anyone else wish to speak to the motion? Seeing none, I'm prepared to call the question. All those in favour of Government Motion 14, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. No. I believe the ayes have it. A division has been called. Ring the bells.
<laughs> Honorable members, a division has been called. All of those in favor, please rise. A division has been called on government motion 14. The Honorable Mr. Shandro, the Honorable Mr. Copping, the Honorable Mr. Guthrie, the Honorable Mr. Dresion, the Honorable Mr. Scow, the Honorable Mr. Madu, the Honorable Minister LaGrange, the Honorable Mr. Ellis, the Honorable Mr. Wilson, the Honorable Mr. Luan, the Honorable Mr. Jones, Mr. Williams, Mr. Hansen, Mr. Yao, the Honorable Ms. Fur, the Honorable Ms. Pawn, the Honorable Mr. Hunter, Ms. Lovely, the Honorable Mr. Yassin, Mr. Rosewell, the Honorable Mr. Jeremy Nixon, Jason, apologies, Mr. Rain, Mr. Walker, Mr. Turton, Mr. Smith. All those opposed to Government Motion 14, please rise. The Honourable Ms. Notley, Ms. Sweet, the Honourable Member Phillips, Member Irwin, the Honourable Mr. Egan, Mr. Member Carson, Mr. Dack, Mr. Diol, the Honourable Mr. Fian. Mr. Speaker, total for the motion, 25. Total against, 9. That motion is so ordered and carried. Committee of the Whole. I would like to call Committee of the Whole to order. The Committee has under consideration Bill A-1. Anyone wishing to add to debate tonight? Sorry, Bill 1, Amendment A-1. I see the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I uh, will try not to take very much time, but I was uh, not quite finished uh, when I last spoke to the uh, many challenges uh, that are embedded in the fact that this government is jamming forward this legislation this evening, uh, notwithstanding the clear opposition of the uh, Grand Chiefs of uh, the treaties here in Alberta and, uh, and treaty leadership. Um, in particular, uh, the uh, minister himself acknowledged today, perhaps we didn't consult enough. Now, the answer to that obvious failure is to wait and to refer this to committee and then take the time to actually engage in meaningful consultation. Uh, anybody who knows anything about engaging in meaningful consultation understands that there must be a little bit of back and forth. Perhaps you don't ultimately agree on everything, but it is not a mere notification process, nor is it a, we'll talk to you after we've done the thing we've already decided on and passed the legislation. That was the point I was trying to make. Before I got a chance to make that point, the members opposite decided to engage in uh, the motion of time allocation, limiting our ability to talk about this issue to a further one hour. Rather unprecedented. This bill was only uh, uh, introduced uh, last Tuesday. First reading, or second reading began on Wednesday. We are now Wednesday night, and it will be jammed through all um, uh, stages uh, and that's incredibly unnecessary particularly given uh, the call from the treaty chiefs today contradicting the assurances made by the minister and by the premier around whether they were ever consulted and asking that this bill be withdrawn 
So I would just like to take this moment, given that instead of doing that, that we are rushing forward at an unprecedented, unwarranted, accelerated speed to jab through this incredibly uh, unconstitutional, disrespectful uh, piece of legislation, I would like to take the opportunity to read into the record the quotes from several uh, um, uh, treaty leaders from today. Chief Tony Alexis, who has been uh, designated to speak on behalf of Treaty 6 as a whole, says, let's be honest, this all comes down to land and resources. We are yet again the inconvenient Indian standing in the way of unprotected resource extraction and other exploitation of treaty lands, end quote. He went on to say, the act puts a lot of uncertainty in investment. If you have a provincial government fighting with the federal government who is not including our First Nation with a lot of disrespect within, it will not be easy to bring investment to this environment. It will hurt the economic fabric of our commerce in all regions. Uh, a portion of Bears Paw First Nation, uh, Chief Daryl Dixon's, um, uh, uh, sorry, Chief Daryl Dixon, or sorry, Okay. Okay. Chief yeah. Daryl Dixon. Yeah. Dixon. Sorry, Chief uh, Daryl Dixon from Bears Paw First Nation said this about the act, quote, this is a warning to Canadians. If you care about these lands, if you care about your country, you should care about this bill. It is not a First Nations issue. This impacts us all, end quote. He went on to say, Bill 1 is just part of a political game. That may be true, but we see in it a disguised attempt to disregard treaty and as a way to gain unlawful access to our lands without restrictions, similar to what they have attempted already with the Alberta Police Act, to overreach and attempt to gain access in jurisdictions where they do not belong and therefore cause more harm to communities. We understand that the vast majority of treaty rights have in practice been um, honoured through the actions of the federal government. Today, we have an uncertain declaration that this government will unlawfully interfere with any range of undetermined actions on the part of the federal government. They have done this without engaging with treaty chiefs. They have done this without consulting. They have now taken that error and rather than trying to apologize and putting things off, say for instance like in Saskatchewan where the whole matter has been deferred until March, instead what we have is this group trying to jam it through through time allocation motions at five after nine on Wednesday night, seven days after this bill first was introduced for second reading. So this is an incredible affront. It will spark an incredible a deterioration in relations between the government of Alberta and treaty uh, leadership across this province. Um, it is a black mark on the record of this government with a government that actually has a lot of black marks on the record. Yeah. But this one, this one is pretty darn historic. And uh, I would once again ask members of the government opposite to vote with their conscience to think about what the long-standing legacy of the relationship is with treaty leadership in this province yep. and vote against this bill uh, in committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Other members wishing to add to the debate tonight? I see the Honourable Member for Edmonton McClung has a Thank you, Mr. Chair. Glad to rise in committee of the whole to speak this evening to uh, uh, Bill 1. And uh, I, I know what we've just witnessed, uh, Mr. Chair, is something that uh, uh, is uh, uh, pretty shocking and disappointing to most Albertans who have a, a respect for these institutions that we serve, uh, particularly uh, uh, here in the legislature, our uh, judicial system, our, our uh, uh, court system. And uh, I know that traditionally, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I mean, students, Alberta students in grade six will be invited to come to the legislature to uh, spend time here to do a a school at the legislature to understand the, the uh, workings of our, our parliamentary system, our Westminster system. And uh, uh, part of that day that they may spend here, uh, Mr. Chair, is spent uh, in study of that Westminster system. And one of the guides they use used to be called a citizen's guide, 
now it's published by the Legislative Assembly, but the part of that is now called the Parliamentary Education Guide. And there's a PDF on the Legislative Assembly website, which is quite instructive. And uh, I wish that the uh, members opposite the government of the day, including the Premier, would have availed themselves of it, because grade six students uh, uh, learn about this uh, in our system of government and the separation of powers. Uh, when they're here for the day, and it would have been her helpful as, as a guide, I think, for the Premier and her government when they were crafting uh, Bill 1 uh, to, to follow, because they may have decided not to go through with it at all. It's fairly elementary, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, because it is designed for elementary students to, to read, and it's an introductory system to our Westminster system of government, which goes on to say, and I quote from it, the Westminster system is a style of government with an executive branch, premier and ministers, a legislative body made up of elected officials, a judicial branch, an impartial court system, and a ceremonial head of state, the lieutenant governor. The name derives from the Palace of Westminster in London, England, where Parliament developed and remains today. And that's what our grade six students are, are taught uh, about our Westminster system of government. And the next uh, element of the, the guide uh, it goes on to talk about the separation of powers in Alberta. And of course, they outline and delineate the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch, and the, the various responsibilities <coughs> laden upon each of those branches of our parliamentary system. And in grade six, uh, Mr. Chair, we expect our students to be grasp these uh, tenets of our parliamentary democracy, uh, yet our government doesn't seem to have them nailed down uh, as the government of Alberta. And had they taken the time to even read the grade six parliamentary guide that's a table on our Legislative Assembly website, I'll table it for them tomorrow if indeed they uh, uh, would like to read it, uh, if indeed they had followed it, they probably would not have gone through with the legislation that they are now trying to salvage by amending it. Uh, Albertans are, uh, are, are ashamed and embarrassed about it. There, there may be an element of support for the legislation, but that's found in the fairly far extreme right wings of the UCP uh, support uh, for their party, and I used to describe that uh, uh, transition that's taken place, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, as the now uh, tail wagging the dog, in, in, in just trying to describe how the, the, the party's been hijacked by the extreme right wing of their uh, of their uh, their political caucus, of their political uh, membership. But in fact, uh, Mr. Chair, I think I need to amend that analogy and, and suggest that now the tail has become the dog. In fact, if you look at the front benches to see who's closest to the Premier and the new arrangement of the deck chairs on the UCP Titanic, uh, those closest to the Premier are not surprisingly the most extreme right flank of the former party known as Conservatives. So indeed, uh, the, the deck chairs on the UCP Titanic have been rearranged and what we have as a result of the uh, leadership being taken over by an extreme right-wing flank is legislation such as Bill 1, and uh, uh, fortunately part of it's been walked back. Now we're looking at uh, uh, another uh, uh, potential amendment, uh, but the, the bill itself is, is, is critically flawed, and uh, uh, on this side of the House we are urging all members of the government to uh, reflect on what even a grade 6 student might say to them in, 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 in analyzing what they've come up with as a piece of legislation, as their flagship piece of legislation, and just simply withdraw the bill. Instead of going to the, the extremes of, of uh, limiting the debate in the, uh, on the legislation, the time allocation that we've just seen imposed upon this legislature of Bill 1, accusing the government in, in justifying it, accusing, sorry, the opposition of, uh, of uh, misusing the time of the House and therefore justifying tab time allocation. Totally to the contrary, Mr. Chair, indeed it's the primary responsibility of all of us as legislators to protect our Charter of Rights and our constitutional rights and the rights as we stand guardian for for, the, for our constituents. The government is acting as, with a total disregard 
for our Constitution and because it suits their own political ideological agenda. Uh, cabinet was about to give themselves the right to make laws unto themselves without further uh, uh, passage by the legislature of the uh, pieces of legislation that was referred to cabinet for consideration. And indeed, they, they were given lawmaking abilities that was uh, the prerogative of this legislature. And uh, that, thankfully, has been uh, amended and, br and brought back. So the so-called uh, Henry VIII clause is no more part of this bill. But it doesn't make it uh, palatable, uh, Mr. Chair, to have this legislation still contain elements which disregard uh, the, uh, the, the courts. And because that is one of the elements uh, of our fundamental uh, uh, democracy, our Westminster system, and the separation of powers that we even we expect a grade six student to, to understand. So indeed, uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the uh, power of the, uh, the courts is still being circumvented by this piece of legislation, which uh, in the opinion of, of legal scholars, such as uh, Martin Olszewski and, and Nigel Banks, there are still serious and persistent legal problems with the bill and therefore the bill remains unconstitutional and as such should be referred to the Alberta Court of Appeal to rule on the constitutionality of the bill. Why in fact would the uh, uh, government not be willing to do this? Why are we looking at imposing a time allocation on such an important fundamental piece of legislation to the government? Uh, they, they see no need to proceed uh, with caution uh, they see no need to refer it to the Alberta Court of Appeal to rule on the constitutionality of the bill, perhaps because they are trying to give the right to themselves in Cabinet to determine what is constitutional and what is not. Uh, we, in fact, as legislators here, are not uh, uh, expected to be the court. We are a separate branch of government, uh, Mr. Chair. We are the legislative branch, and there is another branch of government uh, under our separation of powers in the Westminster system that uh, is the, uh, the judicial branch, and that's uh, our Alberta Court of Appeal, which is the Supreme Court in Alberta, the Court of King's Bench, court, the Alberta Provincial Court, which I know, think is called the Alberta Court of Justice, uh, which needs to be updated on this website. <laughs> but uh, in any case, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the courts exist for a reason, and to circumvent the courts or attempt to do so, uh, to fulfill the political agenda that you have, because it's inconvenient to, to do otherwise is a very sad commentary on the, uh, the dedication or commitment to our parliamentary system, our Westminster system, that this government has. In fact, it, it's a total disregard for it. And uh, I, I don't know, indeed, what, say students coming to, to their, do their one-day uh, tour of the legislature uh, tomorrow are going to face when those tour guides and those instructors and the teachers that are along with them are trying to explain what's happening in the legislature now as they go to the parliamentary education guide and talk about our separation of powers in Alberta and they explain or try to explain to students well you know what this is the way it's supposed to work this is the way it's laid out but currently we have a government right now that's kind of mixing them up and looking at maybe giving this power of, of uh, judicial oversight to themselves so that they can determine what indeed will become a law without further uh, uh, oversight by the courts. And that's something that uh, uh, a grade six student will probably scratch their head at, Mr. Chair, and wonder, well, how can they actually do that? Well, the fact is, Mr. Chair, that it probably will be found not to be able to do that and that courts will actually be asked to rule. And this legislation is going to be held up uh, in court uh, for a long time. And uh, I don't know if uh, the government would be granted, if this legislation actually passes, uh, the opportunity to have it continue uh, while, indeed, the, the court passes judgment on it. But what it does create, Mr. Chair, not only in the minds of the grade six students trying to understand exactly what their government is doing, uh, in contrast to what the separation of powers in the government's own website suggests should be done. Uh, listen to the, the comments of people most recently uh, that I heard at the uh, uh, Piper Law uh, event recently, the uh, Piper Law Winter Reception. I uh, 
I was there a little bit later on uh, in the reception, which was held a few days ago at a local hotel. The Premier had given her speech and left, and uh, I was in the, the wake of the Premier listening to some comments about what uh, folks who had listened to her had said, and they were construction people at high levels. They were lawyers, fairly high-powered lawyers, investors, project stakeholders, and the room had been packed when the Premier was there because they, of course, want to hear what's going on uh, with such a, a devastating blow to democracy in the works. And, in fact, what, what people were saying to me is, well, uh, it's, it's up to the Premier to convince this crowd. This is the crowd that they have to convince. Well, I beg to differ slightly with that. I think the whole population of the province needs to be convinced. But this crowd of lawyers, high-powered high lawyer, lawyers, project stakeholders, construction people, uh, investors, were waiting to be convinced that what the, the Premier was, was up to was in fact going to be useful and, and productive. And they were not convinced, uh, Mr. Chair. That room full of folks who they w went there hoping to have the Premier convince them uh, remained uh, skeptical and concerned. Well, people that I spoke to directly uh, weren't of the opinion that uh, their questions were answered and their fears were allayed. They're going to be continuing to look for more answers to, from this uh, Premier and from this government, which won't be found in the legislation that we have before us, even as amended. So, uh, Mr. Chair, the, uh, the concerns of all of the province and, of course, the, the business leaders in the province are still out there. And uh, the, the fear is, of course, that it's going to be very difficult to make business decisions that will uh, affect projects and, and long-term projects that may be delayed or postponed while this type of legislation is in the books because it's still unclear, even in its amended form, what the effect will be on legislation that might affect their project or their company or their industry. Uh, you can't have that type of uncertainty, Mr. Chair, and go ahead with multi-million dollar projects. Now, certainly there's not everything in the province is going to stop, but there are lots of things, Mr. Chair, which can be postponed, and when you have a situation where uh, a major project is uh, being contemplated by investors who are seeking multi-million dollar loans and financing for that project, the lawyers and the investors and the project stakeholders are all sitting on tenterhooks wondering whether or not the legislation that's before us is actually going to put the kibosh to their project, whether the, uh, the court challenge is going to be the result of the intrusion by the province into the judicial process. So that in and of itself, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, has sent a chill down the spine of the, the business community in this province. Notwithstanding the reassurances of the Premier and other ministers who try to get up and say, no, nah, don't worry, it, they're okay with it, no problem whatsoever. Um, we've got the governor, former governor of the Bank of Canada expressing concerns about this. And, you know, you, the, the government's trying to shoot the messenger on it, but the fact is that the, Mr. David Dodge was appointed uh, and served uh, under Conservative Prime Ministers as well, and his reputation is, is pretty unsullied. So uh, to have a former governor of the Bank of Canada uh, tell the public and be willing to stand and say publicly that this is damaging to the economy, it creates uncertainty, uh, I think has to be taken uh, pretty seriously. So, uh, Mr. Chair, I, uh, I'm pretty concerned uh, even about uh, uh, the legislation as it uh, stands before us today in its uh, amended form, and I, I hope that uh, the government still sees fit to, uh, to pull it uh, from uh, uh, the order paper and uh, perhaps do as the government of Saskatchewan has done, take a time out and really address what the feelings of the, the population of the province are, are for real and respect indeed the opinions of, of legal scholars, of uh, constitutional experts who are saying this is going to be very, very damaging legislation and the government of Saskatchewan has seen fit to do that. Perhaps they will... You know, so. Back, back it out of the public view uh, later on. Right now, they've, they've, uh, they've uh, suspended their legislation until the spring. Uh, I invite the, the, the government to do the same thing, and perhaps they can just simply let it die on the, the order paper or, or 
realize and, and respect the government, uh, the, the, uh, the province's population that says this is not what we want. This is not what we expect at a time when uh, we have an unprecedented uh, uh, number of people uh, occupying our emergency rooms, particularly children, when families are uh, scared about having to make ends meet on a day-to-day -day basis, when the uh, Indigenous population in particular is saying, uh, you're trampling all over our constitutional rights, you have failed to consult with us, and it's a constitutional right we have, it's a treaty right that we have, and the government is trying to explain that they, they did, but in fact you've got uh, the Indigenous population and leadership saying, uh-uh, this didn't happen at all. And the fact that they're saying so in the face of denial by the current minister doesn't look very good uh, for this government, Mr. Chair. Uh, when in, uh, the public knows who they're going to believe, and uh, for, for, for the Indigenous leadership of this province to have to once again come back uh, and, and gear up for a fight with this provincial government after uh, the provincial government, the UCP government has, has tried to claim that they were making amends and following a, a path of reconciliation. Uh, it's pretty disappointing, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, it, it's evidence that they haven't learned a thing. And uh, you can uh, hear them talking about uh, uh, the relationship that they think they have with First Nations uh, uh, leadership and, and populations in the, in the province when they announce partnerships on Project A or Project B. But those one-off projects, uh, Mr. Chair, are not reconciliation. Those are uh, business partnerships, but indeed, overarching all of that, you have to have a consultation progress that is, process that is respectful. And uh, that means a, an open dialogue and a back and forth exchange. And we have a government here telling us that after the fact, they're going to, they're going to actually speak to, uh, to, to, to Indigenous leadership. They're saying that tomorrow, maybe tomorrow afternoon, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and have deeper consultations. In fact, if we add up the number of hours of debate that we might have left here, uh, uh, Madam, uh, Madam Chair, uh, there could maybe be total passage of this Bill 1 before the end of the night if the government decides to keep on, on talking tonight, and th that consultation is not going to happen. So I can only imagine the, the legal battles and the money that's going to be spent, the wasted dollars on both the uh, part of the Indigenous uh, leadership and, and their organizations and in the government in trying to defend this, this uh, foolhardy legislation, uh, th that's totally unnecessary. Absolutely unnecessary. There's, there's no way in the world that Albertans are, are looking at this government with respect and saying this is what we needed right now. They, they're, they're looking at their, their wallets and they're saying, I, I can't afford rent. They're looking at their, uh, their children and thinking, holy smokes, I, I hope to God one of my kids don't get sick and end up in the hospital because there's a 20-hour like, wait and uh, potentially uh, no bed for them to, to go into, into care. Children's uh, uh, hospitals are overflowing, uh, the emergency wards. There's a, a trailer uh, being used as a waiting room in one of our emergency wards in this province. It's, it's unprecedented. It doesn't matter where you go in the province. And the government will say, well, goodness gracious, that's, that's all over the country. That's all over the world. Well, tell you what, this government's responsible for what's happening in their part of the world. It's called Alberta. And they have to take responsibility and take action that's meaningful. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Others are wishing to join the debate. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Meadows. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is my pleasure to rise in the House and have the opportunity to speak to the Bell. Bell 1, Alberta Sovereignty within United Canada Act. On uh, behalf of my constituents and as well as um, concerned Albertans, particularly uh, racialized Albertans. So, I will not be very um, taking uh, very much time as government has enforced the time limit on this <clears throat> debate after avoiding um, spotlights for, for, for the full last week. Um, 
the mainly um, the government understands like for the past whole week I see this bill is not being debated uh, at all during the day uh, because government is uh, was avoiding to face the controversies and uh, the questions and the concerns uh, and the opposition against this bill, um, not only uh, from opposition, but uh, uh, the large majority of Albertans, and as well as uh, uh, from experts, uh, the, the uh, economists, journalists, and um, business organizations. Um, Sticking to and being so much, um, how do I say, um, I'm just trying to word, um, stubborn to uh, get this bill through um, this past phase shows actually um, reflect the lack of vision this GCP government basically has. Not only this, um, also it reflects their lack of ability actually to, you know, have a vision at all. Um, this bill is being uh, opposed by, uh, we were discussed this morning and my um, colleague from MLA from Edmonton McClung mentioned the former uh, governor of the bank, uh, Canadian bank, David Dodge, and um, the former uh, senior economist with ATV. And um, the biggest thing that the, the majority of the GCP leadership contended uh, did not only oppose it, but, but got together, a rally together against this. Um, narrative and the, the, the premier's um, leadership uh, um, mandate uh, to oppose this during the leadership debate. And uh, not only this, this premier, I hope um, if she has a decency would understand, she was not elected on this mandate. And not only this, during the race, um, um, when I'm looking at the first ballot, it was not only the even GCP members uh, kindly, you will see, voted for this issue. The majority of the GCP members in the race actually voted against the premier on this on this issue. So it is surprised to see that the GCP is not. Um, willing to learn from their past experience and they're so intentful to, you know, keep uh, carrying their legacy as, you know, they have been in the past in this province, um, changing their leaders during their term. So in the past four and five um, terms, uh, I believe since 2012, they don't even have um, one term, one single term that I remember where their uh, leader would have actually completed his full term as the leader of the party or the premier of the province because whatever their vision is, whatever they are trying to do in this house after being elected, that is not helping the majority of the Alberta. Due to this, their popularities in the province sank, and they are, every time they are you know, pressured to leave the position. And same thing has happened in, um, in this province um, not long ago. Um, and that was quite just surprising, surprising to see uh, the 
some of these UCP leadership contenders sitting on the um, exec executive council being deaf tone for the last three and a half years, but, but touching those issues, um, they were important in the province during the leadership race. But as soon as they came back to the cabinet tables, they have changed their mind again. So they were discussing the issues of affordability. They were discussing the issue in healthcare, education. And as soon as they're back on the cabinet tables, they seem to have changed their minds. They totally forgot their own debate, their own um, um, you know, positions on this bill. And they're not speaking up. So, but this, this bill, uh, this bill basically is not going to help Albertans, and what I wanted to say, it will not, of course, help the United Conservative Party and, and the government caucus members, because Albertans are very upset, and they're waiting for May 2023, or maybe any time before, when they have opportunity, they will definitely give their answer. And that is what I'm hearing in my community, uh, in my writing from my constituents. And uh, one way the Premier is talking about sovereignty, and sovereignty in, uh, I would say, the inverted commas, but the United Country, sovereignty in the United com Country, is similar to what uh, the Minister uh, of Finance said uh, this afternoon broad but targeted and focused. So, so surprising terms they're coming up with seems like they're not understanding what they're saying or what they're trying to do. Uh, you're talking about sovereignty of the province. That is not really what this bill is proposing. But at the same time, you are not being able to understand what uh, Alvartans and communities and minorities in this province are feeling. Um, when you are making comments like unvaccinated people are the um, most discriminated against group in this province, not being able to understand the racialized and marginalized communities facing uh, the racism in this province and living in fear in their communities and when racism is rising. Uh, in the province big time and, and fail to understand what you are saying. And when you was given the opportunity in this house, you fail to recognize that. So what exactly sovereignty means for those very people? So immigrants are <coughs> afraid, like immigrants move. When they move here, they move to Canada. They move in this country. They don't certainly move in one province. And there's a lot more to do uh, to help those individuals that uh, they are not being exploited, they feel safe, they are able to contribute to our economy in their full capacity, instead of touching the real issues that um, the United Conservative government actually came up with this, I would call, political stunt, political gambit, that is not really going to help, uh, help Alberta, Alberta economy and, and people looking for jobs. And we know 15,000 jobs have been lost since this premier came into the office, since this two months past October. So people are scared, like what would, help, what would happen to the economy? Um, the conservative government did not understand what they were doing in the past three and a half years when they were just, you know, wasting taxpayers' money and uh, the corporations were taking their businesses out, out of the country, out of the provinces to the east. And same thing um, will happen again. The, um, in the chambers, Calgary business of chambers are warming and uh, business organizations are calling for it. Um, but it seems to me that uh, the government um, 
I will say that some members actually don't have guts actually anymore to stand up on behalf of their constituents what they are saying during the leadership debate for those Albertans and those UCP members who trusted them and voted them on their that position. And all of a sudden, they came back to the cabinet tables and they lost um, the whole interest of representing those view, views within their own party, within their own party. So, um, so to be on the record, uh, I wanted to use this opportunity to behalf of my constituents in this house that my constituents, majority of my constituents and, and most of those who came to my office after seeing this bill moving forward and the people in racialized communities openly speaking against it. Like I wanted to be on the record that we strongly oppose this bill. The reason for the opposition to this is this is not helping Albertans. This is not helping Alberta economy that will destroy the economy. And that is also against the, the mandate of, as my colleague just, you know, uh, already said it um, very effectively, it's against the mandate of the Westminster's parliamentary process uh, and procedures. And that's what I've learned. You know, I got the opportunity to be at the CPA, uh, Commonwealth Parliamentary Associations, uh, seminar in, in England, London, with some of the um, GCP members and some conservatives member parliaments. And that's not what was being discussed. We were discussing more about how to build collaborations, coalitions, with equal representations on the committees to help the society at large. But this is not, uh, we are seeing this bill is doing. Uh, on the contrary, this is actually attack, attacking that very process, uh, our democratic process that has took centuries and centuries to come to this. And what this bill is trying to do, replace the role of um, judicial branch to interpret what is legal and what is not legal. And more of this, give the unilateral power to the one person in the House, the ministry, to write what is legal and what is not legal and what is to follow, what is not to follow, and further go you know, beyond this and uh, um, direct the provincial agencies not to follow what it seems to him is not legal in the, in the benefit of, in the, in, the, in, the, in the best interest of the province. So this is a very dangerous move. This is not supported by anyone, particularly not by the majority of Alouettans. And indigenous leadership is um, not even frightened, but very angry. So how this bill is trying to impinge um, their um, treaty rights. And um, this move is very much misguided. And uh, this is not benefit to the province. It will kill our economy. It's killing jobs already. And it will not help the GCP at all. Uh, but this um, I will con I conclude my remarks and uh, I, I will request actually the members of this house on both sides look at once again what we are debating here. So it's going to change the direction, uh, the political direction in this province for the next six months. That will be very harmful for the province and our, for our future generations. Thank you again and oppose this bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are there others to speak to? Oh, can't see you over there. The Honorable Member for Edmonton Highlands Norwood. Okay. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, um, you know, I, I just uh, have to um, uh, acknowledge that uh, I'm speaking here from Treaty 6 territory. I don't typically do a treaty acknowledgement before I speak, but I think it's quite fitting um, given the absolute uh, infringement on treaty rights that is happening with Bill 1, which I'll get to um, shortly. And, uh, you know, I usually give a shout out to all the people tuning in at home, and usually it's just a couple. Uh, so it's a joke, you know, it's the member from Edmonton Goldbar's mom, that sort of thing. Uh, but tonight, I actually know there are a whole heck of a lot of people tuning in um, because they've told me that they are, including uh, folks from Indigenous communities, including folks uh, who've written us as MLAs, calling on us to oppose um, Bill 1. And so um, I'm grateful for those people who are tuning in tonight. Uh, like I said, I know there are a lot of them. They're watching. Albertans are watching. And in fact, people from uh, across Canada are watching and they're paying attention to what's happening here in Alberta. You know, and that's part of why we took uh, the not unprecedented, but the rare step of voting against um, Bill 1, the Sovereignty Act, uh, at first reading. And yeah, and you know what? Uh, the, the member from Edmonton, Glenora, just said, heck yes. And, uh, you know, I, I can say there were people that right, right away that, thought, that, that responded to us saying, well, why would you do that? We knew. We knew that it was going to be damaging. We knew that it was going to be dangerous. Did we know that it would be this uh, incredibly damaging and incredibly dangerous to, um, to Albertans, to uh, the future of our province, to uh, in, in investors who are speaking out, to business leaders, to chiefs, as I alluded to earlier? I don't think any of us predicted it would be just this bad. Now, uh, this is, in fact, uh, my first time speaking to this bill, so I, I, gosh, it's hard to know where to begin. You'd think in a fairly uh, thin bill there might not be a whole lot to speak about, but there is, um, there is a whole heck of a lot. And for those folks watching, I mean, this is, this is the, um, the UCP's Bill 1, so, you know, it's their, uh, their most important, it's their, you know, their flagship sort of bill, and, and gosh, I have to admit, it was quite... Um, surprising to me that at a time when we are in the midst of an absolute crisis in health care, particularly in pediatric health care and children's health care, at a time when all of us are hearing from our constituents about the affordability crisis, about people who are struggling to make ends meet, that this was this government's priority. And, you know, we've asked, we've asked the members opposite multiple times um, why they refuse to speak to the crisis that is health care. What did we see? What did we see on Monday in the span of a few minutes? So first of all, that was our first opportunity uh, as the official opposition to uh, address what had, had bro what had broken on Friday night, and that was the news that Rotary Flames House, uh, which uh, supports uh, children who are um, needing pa palliative care, respite services, the list goes on, that, that those services were going to be paused and that re uh, children res receiving respite services were going to be discharged. We heard that news, it broke on Friday night. Uh, it, people were absolutely up in arms, people were heartbroken hear that news. So at the first opportunity we had uh, when the legislature sat again, Monday afternoon, our members, in fact my colleague from city centre, stood up and demanded that um, we have an emergency debate on this absolute crisis in children's health. What did this government do? They denied it. So a few minutes later, the official opposition leader, the member from Edmonton Strathcona, she stood up with her opportunity to present Bill 201 which was her private member's bill that would address some of the serious um, uh, crises in, in health care. It was our opportunity, her opportunity as a private member to try to support and in fact collaborate with this government. What did they do? They killed that one too. Absolutely. They moved it down the, the order paper. Basically, they deprioritized it. So 
we won't even get to that bill. And we asked the members opposite, why won't you speak about health care? Why won't you address uh, the crisis that you are all hearing from your constituents on? They're silent, and they continue to be silent. So at a time when health care is being ignored, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, affordability is probably, probably for me, for the conversations that I've had with constituents, probably second to health care. People struggling right now would have been a great opportunity to, I don't know, address the affordability crisis, do more than just reverse the cuts that the same government already made, like the re-indexing of H. But no, they chose instead to go with Bill 1, the Sovereignty Act. Sorry, the Alberta Sovereignty within United Canada Sorry, Act. Did I get that? Job killing so sovereignty Act. Sorry, the Job Killing Sovereignty Act. More <laughs> accurately, I don't know if we've got to that amendment yet, uh, member from Edmonton, Glenora. Um, but truly, I mean, it says a lot. It says a lot about this government's priorities. And I had an opportunity uh, the other night, I don't know, I, I was clearly, I, I still don't. Uh, uh, have enough of a social life. I had the opportunity to tune into the debate that was happening in this chamber, and um, some of our members were, were were talking about Bill One, and, and one of the members asked another member if you know if they were hearing about the Sovereignty Act uh, at the doors, and uh, one of the members said, "No, no, actually, to be honest, I haven't heard much about it." And I can say, you know what? Um, I hadn't, like n nobody uh, organically would ever, I always, when I come, to, when I door knock, I, I come to a door and I ask, you know, what issues are top of mind for you? Um, nobody organically prior to this bill being introduced would have ever said, oh, you know, I'm really worried about Alberta's uh, sovereignty. No, not at all. Uh, and, that, and that's that's the honest truth. Exactly. Right? And I can say that from not just Edmonton Highlands Norwood. You might say, well, the, you're in a, an orange paradise there in Edmonton Highlands Norwood. I am. You're, you're, you're correct. Um, but uh, I've door knocked in Edmonton Southwest. I've door knocked. I've door knocked everywhere. Thank you to the member from Edmonton Strathcona for giving me a boost tonight. I've door knocked a lot all over this province. That's a fact. Medicine Hat, where the Premier currently, uh, I was going to say currently resides, but that's not true. She doesn't, <laughs> she doesn't live there. She, d she does represent it, though. I, I think she visited a couple times during the campaign, so we can get, we can, I don't think since, since she's won the election. That's unfortunate. Because I can tell you, I door knocked five times with our amazing candidate, Gwendolyn Dirk, there, and had a lot of conversations with people. Healthcare, education, affordability, top three issues. Absolutely, yep. A uh, member from, uh, uh, from Lethbridge West, same thing, she door knocked there. She, she can corroborate that. But I will tell you, and I have one story from door knocking in Medicine Hat that sticks with me. There was one young, so I'll tell you, I walked up with a volunteer, and uh, there, I can picture the house still, there was a big truck backed up into the driveway, and I thought, Okay, this could be, you, you never know, you never want to assume. I'm like, let's, let's check this one out. Get to the door, young guy, hat on, answers the door. And I was like, hey, you know, to do my little spiel. I, we're out with Gwendolyn Dirk, she's running to be your uh, MLA here. You know, what issues are top of mind? I swear to you, and you can ask that volunteer. What did he say to me? He said, he said, he said you are getting our support, the NDP, because um, I'm an Albertan and I'm a Canadian. And, and it's Alberta, Canada, and that was his message. And we said, oh, so you're talking about sovereignty. He's like, absolutely. And, and I asked him, I said, have you voted uh, NDP in the past? He said, no, I never have. Uh, so there, it did come up at the doors, and it was, it, 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 but not in the way that this government would, would hope. And so, you know, I, I, and I tell those stories because, uh, you know, I can give the example of, of door knocking uh, recently in Edmonton Southwest, and same thing. I had a, uh, I had a long time, uh, the member from Edmonton Southwest uh, is, is noting something as well. I had a long time conservative who said that he's alarmed about the Sovereignty Act as well. And I think everybody, I see my, my colleagues uh, on our side of the house nodding their heads, right? That you're, th that you're hearing, sorry, that I'm getting. I'm getting some heckles that I'm not quite hearing from the member from Edmonton Southwest, but I'm sure he will join debate here shortly. I'm certain he will do that and share his, share his thoughts. No, no time, no time, because this UCP government, this same UCP government that is putting forth what has been called the most undemocratic piece of legislation in Alberta's history, is also, is also implementing time allocation, which means they're limiting debate on this very bill that countless Albertans, including that member from Edmonton Southwest constituents, have spoken out against. So I would give this perhaps as a warning to that member and other members on that side of the House that they might want to start listening to their constituents, if not 
early retirement. He continues to heckle me for those folks watching at home who can't quite hear that. So it's not just longtime Conservatives in that member's riding that are concerned. It's economists. It's constitutional law experts. It's the former uh, Bank of uh, Canada Governor David Dodge, who many people have spoken about today, who shared his, his uh, concerns on that bill as well. It's their, own, it's their own MLAs, it's their own cabinet ministers who are speaking out, who've spoken out, but have suddenly changed their mind. You know, the same cam cabinet ministers, the, like the deputy premier well, who said... Cabinet pay bump. That, pa convincing. that cabinet pay bump, the member from Edmonton Strathcona says that must be enough to, to change their minds because the, one of the now, you know, one of, one of the deputy premiers, which is hard enough to say <laughs> in a, in a, with, with a leader in a government that claims to care about small government, largest cabinet uh, in history as well. The now Deputy Premier uh, from Lethbridge East, uh, Lethbridge East said that no one person should be able to enact regulations without consultation. The Finance Minister called it an economic time bomb. The Jobs Minister called it a fairy tale. The Municipal Affairs Minister called it anarchy. And the Minister of Trade said it was like shooting ourselves in the foot. So those are just some. There's many more quotes that I could share, but again, not enough time. So. Those are just some, some of the, the quotes from this, own, from, from this government's own cabinet ministers. And when asked and when pressed by us in question period um, about why, uh, why they've changed their minds, what, what's, what's changed for them, we didn't get clarity. And so I'd welcome the opportunity for any of those um, ministers to, um, to clarify for us. What changed? Don't tell me it was just the pay bump. What changed? So, uh, it's, and it's so interesting, and again, I know the, the people watching at home can't quite hear everything that's going on here, but it's, it's so interesting that you get a lot of heckling from that side of the house, but they're not willing to stand up and defend, defend their position on this bill. Because I guarantee you, I don't know if any of them are knocking on doors, but I guarantee you they are going to be hearing from their constituents if they do. How could you support Bill 1? How could you sit silently, other than heckling, how could you sit silently in that legislature and not get on the record? One of the things that I'm most concerned about when it comes to Bill 1, the Sovereignty Act, is the fact that uh, Indigenous uh, folks have not been adequately consulted. And that became very clear, very clear uh, today by noting that the, the Minister for Indigenous Relations uh, has completely dropped the ball in this file. And I mean, we don't, we're not totally sure if it's, if it's fully him or if it's the Premier as well, or perhaps it's other members of Cabinet. But um, it, all at the top. it all starts at the top. As somebody who was Premier, she understands that, you know, you would apologize and you would take a hit. Don't see that from this, don't see that from this government. Um, so that, that minister uh, basically said that he had consulted those Treaty 6, 7, and 8 chiefs, uh, when in fact he hadn't. And what did we hear from Chief Alexis, who's speaking on behalf of Treaty 6? He said, let's be honest, this all comes down to land and resources. We are yet again the inconvenient Indian standing in the way of unprotected resource extraction and other exploitation of treaty lands. Wow, some pretty powerful words. What else does he go on to say? This act puts a lot of uncertainty in investment. If you have a provincial government, fighting with the federal government, who is not including our First Nation with a lot of disrespect within, it will not be easy to bring investment to this environment. It will hurt the economic fabric of our commerce in all regions. That should be alarming to these members, these UCP members. That should be absolutely alarming. And I'd love, I'd love to hear uh, the MLAs from the area that uh, Chief Alexis represents to to, to go on the record and explain how they could possibly support a bill when, when the, the treaty chief for their area is, is raising the alarm. Unbelievable. Chief Dixon, Chief Daryl Dixon is uh, uh, from Bearspaw uh, First Nation. And, and Chief Dixon says, this is a warning to all Canadians. If you care about these lands, if you care about your country, you should care about this bill. It's not just a First Nations issue. This impacts us all. Wow. It's not just a First Nations issue. This impacts us all. He goes on to say it's part of a political game. That may be true, but we see it as a disguised attempt to disregard treaty 
and see it as a way to gain unlawful access to our lands without restrictions, similar to what they have attempted with the Alberta Police Act to overreach and attempt to gain access in jurisdictions where they do not belong and where they cause more harm to communities. Wow. Powerful words from uh, the chief from Bear's Paw First Nation. And he's right. He's right. We'd be... <laughs> yeah, and sorry, I'm getting heckled from one of the members over there and one of the same members who we never seem to hear from uh, in this chamber. Interrupt um, <clears throat> so late into your speech, just a caution to speak through yeah. the chair. Please. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, uh, that warning, um, Madam Chair. I just, I just find it so, um, so interesting that, um, you know, we, we saw this, we've seen this multiple times in the few days that we've been in the chamber, um, Madam Chair, that, uh, you know, this government claims to, to uh, you know, to care about so many of these issues like health care, like sovereignty apparently, um, like property rights, and yet they're not standing up and defending their positions. So... I don't know. Okay, I've got a few more things that I want to say on the record. I don't know how much time I have left, but I could go on for hours, and luckily we, we will, well, only for hours, unfortunately. One. One, one, that's right. So one of the other, um, you know, I, I want, I guess I want um, Albertans to know, because there are a lot of Albertans um, watching from home uh, who, are, who are concerned, and rightly concerned, uh, about what they see in this bill. And you know, I, I want Albertans that are watching to know that there is that there is hope out there, and that this is unfortunately uh, a short a blip that we're all going to have to deal with, but that change is closer um, than it's ever been because Albertans are asking for stable and responsible and honest leadership. And you know, we had the opportunity not long ago to present an alternate speech from the throne, that, and that was. That was our opportunity to say to Albertans, you know what? But pursuant to government motion 14 there. agreed to earlier in this assembly, I must now dispose of Bill 1 in Committee of the Whole and put the question. On, a move, uh, on Amendment A1, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no. no. That is carried. Division has been called to ring the bells.
Honourable members, a division has been called on Amendment A1 on Bill 1. All those in favour of the amendment, please stand. The Honourable Mr. Shandro, the Honourable Mr. Copping, the Honourable Mr. Guthrie, the Honourable Mr. Drisian, the Honourable Mr. Newdorf, the Honourable Mr. Scow, the Honourable Mr. Monty, <coughs> the Honourable Minister Lagrange, the Honourable Mr. Ellis, the Honourable Mr. Wilson, the Honourable Mr. Luan, the Honourable Mr. Jones, Mr. Williams, Mr. Hansen, Mr. Yao, the Honourable Ms. Furr. The Honourable Ms. Pon, the Honourable Mr. Hunter, Ms. Lovely, the Honourable Mr. Yassine, Mr. Rosewell, the Honourable Mr. Jason Nixon, Mr. Reed, Mr. Rain, <coughs> Mr. Walker, Mr. Churton, Mr. Smith. All those opposed to the amendment, please stand. The Honourable Ms. Notley, Ms. Sweet, the Honourable Member Phillips, the Honourable Member Hoffman, Ms. Goring, Member Irwin, the Honourable Mr. Egan, Member Carson, Mr. Dack, Mr. Diol, the Honourable Mr. Billis, the Honourable Mr. Fian. Madam Chair, total for the amendment 27, total against 12. Honourable Members, that is carried. And I'll call the question on Bill 1, the Alberta Sovereignty Within a United Canada Act. On the clauses of the bill, are you agreed? agreed. Any opposed? No. Carried. A division has been called. Or ring the bells. One minute. One minute. Members, a division has been called on the clauses of the bill. All those in favour, please stand. The Honourable Mr. Shandro, the Honourable Mr. Copping, the Honourable Mr. Guthrie, the Honourable Mr. Drisian, the Honourable Mr. Newdorf, the Honourable Mr. Scow, the Honourable Mr. Madu, the Honourable Minister Lagrange, the Honourable Mr. Ellis, the Honourable Mr. Wilson, 
The Honorable Mr. Luan, the Honorable Mr. Jones, Mr. Williams, Mr. Hansen, Mr. Yao, the Honorable Ms. <coughs> Fur, the Honorable Ms. Pawn, the Honorable Mr. Hunter, Ms. Lovely, the Honorable Mr. Yassine, Mr. Rosewell, the Honorable Mr. Jason Nixon, Mr. Reed, Mr. Rain, Mr. Walker, Mr. Turton, Mr. Smith. All those opposed, please stand. The Honorable Ms. Notley, Ms. Sweet, the Honorable Member Phillips, the Honorable Member Hoffman, Ms. Goring, Member Irwin, the Honorable Mr. Egan, Member Carson, Mr. Dack, Mr. Diol, the Honorable Mr. Billis, the Honorable Mr. Fian. Madam Chair, total four, 27, total against, 12. Honorable members, that is carried. Now, on the title and preamble, are you agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Carried. Shall the bill be reported? Are you agreed? agreed. Any opposed? No. That is carried. The Honorable Government House Leader. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that we rise and report Bill 1. I heard the motion to rise and report. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Please say no. no. That is carried. I heard it. We rise and report the Honourable Member yeah. from Airdrie East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Committee of the Whole is under consideration certain bills. The Committee reports the following bill with some amendments. Bill 1. Mr. Speaker, I wish to table copies of an amendment considered by Committee of the Whole in this state for the official record of the Assembly. Thank you, Honourable Member. Does the Assembly concur with the report? All those in favour? Opposed? So ordered. <coughs> Under Government Bills and Orders for Third Reading, Bill 1, Alberta Sovereignty Within the United Canada Act, Honourable Ms. Smith. The Honourable Deputy House Leader. No. Premier. Deputy Premier. Apologies. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it, um, it gives me great pleasure to rise on behalf of the Honourable Premier uh, to move third reading of Bill 1, the Alberta Sovereignty Within a United Canada Act. Mr. Speaker, if passed, the Act will become a tool, a shield, that allows the Alberta government to push back on federal legislation, policy or measures that are unconstitutional or harmful to our province, our people, and our economic prosperity. Mr. Speaker, the Constitution of Canada provides sovereign, exclusive jurisdictional powers to the federal government and the provinces. Mr. Speaker, they are called exclusive federal powers and exclusive provincial powers. Alberta, Mr. Speaker, has its exclusive provincial powers that are sovereign, and the federal government are not allowed to legislate in those areas. The federal government is not allowed to hide under any pretense to intrude on exclusive provincial powers. Mr. Speaker, these three foundational legal documents taken together constitute the Constitution of our country. The Constitution Act 1867, the Constitution Act 1930, and the Constitution Act 1982, otherwise known as the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Mr. Speaker, it is important that, that, that to reiterate to our fellow citizens that the rights and powers granted to Alberta by these constitutional documents are not subordinate to the Government of Canada. Mr. Speaker, to the contrary, exclusive provincial powers outlined in sections 92, 92A, including 
property and civil rights in the province, laws respecting non-renewable natural resources, forestry resources, and electrical energy. Exploration for non-renewable non natural resources, development, conservation, and management of non-renewable natural and forestry resources, including laws in relation to the rate of primary production, development, conservation, and management of sites and facilities in the province for the generation and production of electrical energy, and laws respecting export of non-renewable natural resources from one province to the other. These are exclusive provincial jurisdictions. Of course, Mr. Speaker, Section 93, that deals with education, and indeed the concurrent powers in Section 95 respecting agriculture and immigration. Mr. Speaker, Bill 1 is therefore constitutionally structured in a manner that gives the Alberta, that gives Alberta the legislative framework and a democratic approach to affirm and defend the federal provincial division of powers while absolutely respecting Canada's constitution, the court, and indeed the treaty rights that are constitutionally guaranteed. Mr. Speaker, a review of Bill 1 will show clearly, and Mr. Speaker, I'm going to, I'm going to read it uh, directly from the text of, of Bill 1. It, it affirms in Section 2, Mr. Speaker, that nothing in Bill 1 affects the treaty right guaranteed in the Constitution in Section 35. Mr. Speaker, for decades, and despite Alberta's best effort to get the federal government to respect our jurisdictions and ensure equal and fair treatment to all provinces, the federal government ignores the cries and pleas of our people and government. This unfortunate state of affairs has been made worse by the current Liberal government under this Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. Mr. Speaker, as if that is not bad enough, the Trudeau Liberals now entered into an unholy alliance with the Socialist Federal NDP leader, Jagmeet Singh. Mr. Speaker, this alliance has been devastating to Alberta's economy. We have seen how total disregard of the constitutional order has harmed Albertans, our way of life, and economy. From the cancellation of Energy East, Northern Gateway, and Keystone XL, to the passage of Bill C-69, C-48, and the imposition of the carbon tax that has made life more expensive and less affordable. The devastation that this federal liberal government has caused on the oil and gas sector is unimaginable. Mr. Speaker, the opposition brags about Trans Mountain Pipeline. But Mr. Speaker, I've got news for them. The Liberals and the NDP have effectively ended private investment in pipelines. Mr. Speaker, the Trans Mountain Pipeline was proposed by the private sector. And Mr. Speaker, all of us, members of this legislature, must be worried when a, gov a government that is in the business of public services decided to chase away private investment to occupy that particular field. That is the reason why, till today, we are still not sure when Trans Mountain is going to be completed. I would rather prefer that the government that is in the business of public services stay in its lane, allowing the private sector to do what they know how to do best. So, Mr. Speaker, I cannot also forget that when Albertans voted in a supermajority of 62 percent to remove the principle of equalization, the Prime Minister ignored Alberta and to this day has never made any attempt to acknowledge, to meet, to discuss the expectations of Albertans. Mr. Speaker, instead, the Prime Minister gave us the worst a most hostile minister to Alberta, Minister of Environment, Stephen Gibault, whose mission is simply to undermine the largest subsector 
of the Canadian economy, the oil and gas sector. Mr. Speaker, as I indicated before, previous governments have tried and Albertans have been exceedingly patient. The former NDP Premier and leader of the opposition imposed the now infamous multi-billion dollar carbon tax on Albertans that she and her party did not campaign for in 2015. The, NDP, the former NDP leader's excuse, Mr. Speaker, was to buy social license. Mr. Speaker, instead of social license, Alberta's economy was devastated by, by that leader of the opposition and Justin Trudeau, her friends and ally at the federal level. Mr. Speaker, here are a few ways that that quest for the so-called social license are paid Alberta. Mr. Speaker, 183,000 Albertans lost their job, whilst the leader of the opposition was the Premier of Alberta. Multi-billions of dollars in deficit, more than $70 billion in debt that the Kenny, that the Kenny government inherited in 2019, collapse of the commodity prices, and an economy that was brought to its needs by the dangerous combination of the federal liberal policies and the provincial NDP policies right here in our borough. Mr. Speaker, we must never allow that to happen again in this province. Mr. Speaker, we must shield our brother and say enough is enough. The federal government must stay in the island as our founding fathers and the drafters of our constitution had envisioned. Mr. Speaker, it is important that I am clear on what the Alberta sovereignty within a United Canada Act will not do, because we've seen a lot of fear-mongering on the part of the leader of the opposition and indeed the NDP MLAs and the allies across the province. Yes. Mr. Speaker, it is important to note that the, the Alberta sovereignty within a United Canada will not do the following. It will not allow Alberta to defy Canada's constitution. Mr. Speaker, I want to reiterate that and to our viewers watching back home. And despite all of the fear mongering and all the division, and all the division that the NDP have attempted to perpetuate, this bill, if it becomes law, will not defy Canada's constitution. Mr. Speaker, it will not allow Alberta to ignore decisions of our court. It is important to reiterate that once again. But that's one, of the, that, that's one of the misinformation that we have heard from the leader of the opposition and her MLAs and indeed, again, their allies across the province. Mr. Speaker, this bill will not also allow Alberta to separate from Canada. I recall when this bill was first proposed that they jumped on that, that this is a separation bill. Madam, Mr. Speaker, it is now clear that all of that were all misinformation and fear-mongering. Mr. Speaker, this law will also not allow cabinet to I issue unconstitutional orders in council. Mr. Speaker, it will not allow cabinet to direct private individuals or corporations that are not provincial entities to violate uh, federal laws. And Mr. Speaker, it is not true that this bill will chase away investors. Mr. Speaker, it was the NDP, while they were in government between 2015 and 2019, that scared away investors and devastated our province. In fact, Mr. Speaker, the threat that, face, that Alberta faces today is from the NDP. So, Mr. Speaker, despite the fear mongering by the leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition and her NDP MLAs and their allies, the above remains true today and it will also remain true tomorrow. Mr. Speaker, Premier Smith has taken on board. Apologies, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Premier has taken on board the concerns of our caucus members and indeed the concerns of our Albertans and an amendment that addresses those concerns have been put forward in this assembly. Mr. Speaker, I am glad that we took on board the concerns of our Albertans and for that strengthened this particular bill to achieve its original intention. To be clear, Mr. Speaker, if a resolution of this Legislative Assembly identifies an amendment of a statute, it will allow the normal legislative process and ultimately a bill will be tabled in this House by the responsible Minister. Mr. Speaker, I urge all members of this Assembly to vote to pass Bill 1 in defence of our province, in defence of our burdens, 
and in Alberta's best interest. With that, Mr. Speaker, I move third reading on behalf of the Honourable Premier. Thank you, Honourable Member. I see the Honourable Member for Edmonton Glenora has risen. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm uh, uh, always uh, honoured to have an opportunity to rise in this House and speak to legislation. I think that the uh, bill we're considering is slightly less honourable, but um, uh, nonetheless, we're here tonight to debate the job-killing, um, democracy-threatening Sovereignty Act. And uh, in terms of democracy-threatening, we've already seen uh, the current government uh, choose to bring in closure on this bill that they know is so deeply unpopular that they're trying to ram through. And, and one of the reasons I will give uh, you know the members of the cabinet a lot of credit. One of the reasons why it is so unpopular is because they spent months telling people how dangerous this bill would be if it came forward to the legislature. Um, every uh, single uh, UCP leadership candidate, other than the now premier, um, was very clear that this was a, a threat to our economic security, yep. that this was damaging to Alberta's international and, and national reputation, and that it would have grave consequences for the people of Alberta. And you know what? They were right. They were right, absolutely right. And that, uh, um, through you, Mr. Speaker, is one of the reasons why when members come to this House and they say, well, Albertans didn't vote for blah, 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 whatever it is, Albertans certainly did not vote for this bill to come forward to this place because only 1% of the uh, actual population voted for this Premier. 99% of Albertans did not endorse the plan that the current Premier has to come into this place and bring forward a piece of legislation that is killing jobs in the province of Alberta, that is hurting our economy, that is threatening our international reputation. 99% of Albertans uh, did not give you the authority to come forward into this place and to bring forward a bill that's so damaging uh, to uh, so many Albertans. And, and for anyone who wants to throw around the term sovereignty, and we've seen the Deputy Premier do it here tonight uh, quite uh, successfully, throw around the word sovereignty many, many times. The Premier has. Uh, it's definitely been uh, bouted about in this chamber as well as uh, on uh, debates and, and in news conferences. Um, when, when you think of the word sovereignty, I hope that you also ponder other times in my lifetime and yours when sovereignty has been front and centre and what the economic impacts were of that debate at that time. Because I can tell you, there are still downtown towers in Montreal that used to house head offices for major corporations that moved to Toronto. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that there are business people in Calgary, there are business people in South Edmonton, Southwest Edmonton, in fact, that are deeply concerned about the impacts that this bill will have on investment that they are desperately trying to attract from uh, the region and uh, nationally and internationally. And I can tell you that one of the things that they are concerned about is that when we have uh, a premier that is such a loose cannon and a cabinet that shows no spine when they've spent months campaigning against this very bill to come in here and all of a sudden decide that they're going to you know, stand up multiple times to endorse and support it and in fact bring in closure at multiple stages to try to ram it through in the wee hours of the night or the early hours of the morning. Uh, it speaks to the kind of uh, ambition that the current Deputy Premier, multiple Deputy Premiers or other people around the front bench uh, show in the lack of conviction to the words that they spouted just a few short months ago. Some just a few short weeks ago. And I can say his name now, uh, former Premier Kenny. Uh, Premier Kenny, to his credit, just a few short hours after this bill was introduced, resigned his seat. Yep. Resigned his seat because I suspect that he didn't want to be one of the people who was forced to come into this place and stand up over and over and over again to vote for something that he knew was going to damage Alberta and Alberta's reputation. He was very clear throughout the summer and into the early fall that he felt the Sovereignty Act would have detrimental impacts, uh, detrimental effects on the future of the province of Alberta and economic investment for this province. And he's right. Mm -hmm. He is right, Mr. Speaker. Um, I also have to say that um, uh, there is a specific clause in here that uh, gives me great pause, and that's the fact that the government wants to write in the clause, has written in the clause, and, and didn't amend it out. In fact, they added uh, even more opportunities, even more uh, uh, leeway for themselves to be able to vote on things in here and then go behind closed doors and do what they so choose. The clause is uh, under Resolution 3, uh, B sub 2, um, that the, the, if a motion is passed around causes, um, that, that the members believe causes or is anticipated to cause harm, that they can go into the back room and they can write a bill that doesn't see the light of day and that they can change the law unilaterally. 
Well, that is obviously very bad for democracy, Mr. Speaker, and in turn, very bad for investment in the province of Alberta. Uh, and to again reiterate, 99% uh, of Albertans did not vote for this Premier. And there were many, many members of this caucus, and in particular of the current cabinet, who campaigned very aggressively against this bill. Um, and they should be uh, showing that, again, that, that courage of their convictions to be able to stand by the words that they so eloquently spoke just a few short months ago when begging and pleading for votes around the province, when talking about the kind of threat that this would impose on our province. And I can also say that when I am spending time uh, connecting with Albertans uh, right across this province, uh, many are talking about uh, affordability, about public health care, and about the economy. And this, Mr. Speaker, uh, does nothing to support any of those three pillars, and in fact, it erodes them in significant ways. So the government wants to pass a bill in this place and then be able to go into the back room. And if they think something in the Canada Health Act causes harm or may possibly perceive to be perceived to cause harm, that they can go into the back room and they can rewrite um, legislation here and fail to impose. Um, when we were in the very first briefing uh, with the media, or not briefing, I guess it was Q&A with the media, and it was very clear that there were serious concerns being raised about the, the, the lack of legality that this bill would have. And um, the sponsoring minister, uh, the current minister of justice, decided to uh, ask the deputy minister to come out from the back room and explain his legislation. Because clearly the deputy minister and the premier either didn't understand it, couldn't explain it, or they didn't care. They wanted somebody else to be on the news not having to carry water for their terrible bill that they were bringing forward to this place. And to the deputy's credit, I, I wouldn't want to be in that position. They are failing at a political press conference because they've put politics before the economy. They've put politics before democracy. They are failing, they are floundering, and they try to call the deputy in to come and defend them. Mr. Speaker, that is embarrassing. That does not give anybody a sense of confidence that the front bench knows what they're doing, that the front bench has any sense of uh, stability, that the front bench cares about um, uh, what the key issues are for Albertans right now around affordability, the economy, and public health care. Also in that uh, initial press conference, questions were asked about the role of the RCMP and this implication around the RCMP through this bill. And it was clarified by the current Justice Minister that the RCMP is seen as a contractor and that contractors would apply to this legislation. So if there are issues with contractors, the front bench can go back down the hall into a quiet room and they can write themselves another piece of legislation that could infringe on relationships with contractors, that could break those relationships. And they're a contractor, the ju current Justice Minister said, in relation to the federal government being their, uh, essentially their employer. So um, we know that it is uh, hugely unpopular um, every time uh, members of the front bench, including the current Justice Minister and the former Justice Minister, have talked about messing with the RCMP. Albertans aren't keen on that. Albertans know that that is a huge uh, boondoggle economically. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, as a kid who grew up in a small community in northern Alberta, uh, we had a lot of RCMP come in for their two years from across the country, serve their time, and go on to other communities. And how would we be able to attract and retain um, uh, in, in a model like that, Mr. Speaker? We absolutely wouldn't. We relied on those RCMP members from across the country to come and serve our community and, and the region in the north to make sure that we had stability in terms of policing. And I imagine the member from Lesser Slave Lake uh, knows exactly what I'm talking about. So this bill has the potential to cause grave economic harm, and, and we're already seeing from uh, many employers that the Premier's been asked day after day to name just one CEO who thinks this bill's a good idea. And the best she can come up with is some representatives of some organizations say they don't think it'll be that bad. But nobody says it'll be good. Nobody says that this is going to move things forward, that this is going to help. Nobody's willing to put their business's reputation on the line for that. Mm -hmm. Why are we here, Mr. Speaker, if not to do things to make things better? If not to move... The former member for um, uh, Brooks Medicine Hat, um, who uh, in turn was, uh, you know, resigned her seat to give the premier seat, um, but the, the former member from Brooks Medicine Hat talked about coming to this place like we do when we go camping, that you want to leave the campsite better than the way you found it. This does not make things better for democracy than the way we found it, Mr. Speaker. This erodes democracy, it hurts our economy, and it is damaging to our national and international reputation. And I call on the cabinet ministers 
who so eloquently campaigned against this bill all summer and into the fall to stand by the courage of their convictions, to stand by their words when they were talking about wanting to give stability back to the people of Alberta. And if you won't stand by what you said just a few short months ago, you're going to have to stand on the record in this place and every single time you voted for this. And I'll tell you, it's not popular. People don't like it. That's why you're trying to ram it through here in the middle of the night. Because you don't have the confidence to do this in the middle of the day in the light of, in the, light of uh, the public eye. You, don't, you know that this isn't right. And earlier today when uh, our leader uh, said, you know, if this gets rammed through today before the, tr the treaty chiefs, the grand chief and other uh, uh, treaty chiefs have an opportunity to engage in a meaningful way, you're doing a disservice to the treaty, you're breaking the treaty. Um, uh, there was a point of order called by, I think by the government house leader, saying, oh, how dare you assume that we're going to pass this bill today? And here we are, here we are, at almost 11 o'clock, at almost 11 o'clock at night, and I have a feeling that they're going to bring in closure yet again, because they've done it already, multiple times, because they don't want people to stop and think about what they are trying to ram through. But guess what? They're already thinking about it, because your Premier, Jason Kenney, your front bench, many of whom are still in the front bench, who were running for his job over the summer, yeah. made it very clear that everyone knows exactly where Alberta stands on this issue and that Alberta will be hurt by uh, even considering the Job Killing Sovereignty Act. Yeah. That's why they want to do it fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't want to have to stand by their vote. They don't want to have to stand up and defend what they've done and how they've rammed this through. Congratulations on being so effective in communicating all summer and into the fall about how damaging this was. You were right. In fact, it's even worse than you said it was going to be because it has um, uh, huge um, dictatorial powers that have been embedded in it as well. Yep. So please, take a few moments, stop and consider exactly what you want your record to be because your record will be put forward to the people in just a few short months. It's less than six months. I, I remember standing in this place and saying, the second half of your term goes faster than the first half. That's my experience. The first half of your term, you feel like you got lots of time, lots of opportunities. This is either the last or the second last bill one you'll be bringing forward to this place. And this is what you want to run on. Feel free. Can't wait. Can't wait to take this and health care and affordability and economic impacts at large to the voters of the province of Alberta. And if you can't wait either, then call the election. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Other members wishing to speak to Bill 1, the Alberta Somedy within the United Canada Act. I see the Honourable Member for Edmonton Rutherford has stood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to third reading of um, Bill 1. Um, but I do so with deep, deep disappointment uh, that we have gotten here at all, and secondarily that we have gotten here in this uh, terrible way of, of uh, having closure invoked continuously on each stage of the bill so that we cannot uh, hear um, what people need to say about this bill. Uh, we know that certainly people are talking about this bill out in the community. We are uh, seeing repeated calls for this government to stop this bill from people who normally would be considered to be supporters of uh, this style of government that the, is offered by our current government, people that are um, considered part of their their community coming out repeatedly saying this is not good. This is bad for the province of Alberta. Um, and the thing that I'm concerned about is that as these people come forward, people who have, who have um, you know, built reputations in, in this country over, over years for the work that they've done, that the response they get from this government is not to listen to them, but rather to disparage them. We, um, we've seen, for example, uh, David Dodge, who was the governor of the Bank of Canada, a position that is incredibly important in this country, being described by this premier as a liberal appointee, when in fact he was the governor of the Bank of Canada, yeah, and he served under pre, uh, Prime Minister Harper at one point. You know, to, to 
to take someone who has done the work that David Dodge has done in this country and to try to find ways to disparage him because uh, they don't happen to like what he has to say is, is really unacceptable to me. We also saw this Premier um, make comments about the CEO of CAP and the CEO of the Calgary Chamber saying, well, they obviously haven't talked to their members. Insulting them by saying they don't know what they're talking about or they don't represent the people they in fact do represent. And again today, we see uh, this Premier and other members of this, uh, this cabinet and this government disparaging the leaders of the First Nations by saying to them, oh, they're only doing this because the uh, NDP is scaremongering. That's what they said earlier today, that this is just a reaction to scaremongering, which I can tell you the First Nations tell me is a very insulting thing to say to them. It, what you're saying to them is they're too dumb to figure it out for themselves, and they're only doing it because they're being scared by somebody on this side of the house. How can you call a whole group of people? It's insulting. Uh, uh, call them stupid by saying that they don't have a, a, uh, a clue as to why this may be a bad bill on their own terms, in their own right. Uh, and that's what we've seen continuously in this House. We've seen the disparaging of people who, are, who have done incredibly important things in this country because they don't agree with this bill. And they don't agree with it on very substantive bases. They don't agree with it because it's been d demonstrated repeatedly by scholars in the area that it's unconstitutional. It's been demonstrated repeatedly by people in the community that it is uh, a, a, an ideological bill which is not supported by the majority of people in this province because it does not address the issues that are important to the people of this province. It's about shoring up the base for people who are deeply afraid they're about to lose the next election, and that's it. So I think it's, it's very important that we spend some time talking about what it is that all of these people these many hundreds of thousands of people who are objecting to this bill, what they're actually saying. And we've had an opportunity in this House to read out some of the comments by the CEO of CAP or the CEO of, of uh, the Calgary Chamber or, or uh, by David Dodge. And we've had an opportunity to hear some of the comments by some of the chiefs from Treaties 6, 7 and 8. Uh, uh, about this bill and I think it's time that we actually stop this whole bill that we n do not move ahead uh, in uh, this third reading and that we actually go back and do the consultation that should have been done and as a result I am bringing a uh, amendment into the house Oh, do I just walk you on the hand to somebody? No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's there. So, Honourable Members, this will be Amendment RA1, and I'll ask the Honourable Member to read it into the record for us, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate that. I um, am bringing notice of this amendment on behalf of the Member of St. Albert to move that the motion for third reading of Bill 1, the Alberta Sovereignty within the United Canada Act, be amended by deleting all of the words after that and substituting the following. Bill 1, Alberta Sovereignty within a United Canada Act, 
be not now read a third time because the Assembly is of the view that the government has not discharged its legal duty to consult with First Nations and Indigenous peoples in respect of the, po the potential impact of the bill's provisions, if enacted, would have on their, on their rights and treaties. Thank you. Now, I think the, it's very important that we uh, bring forward some of the, the words of uh, some of the First Nations uh, at this particular time, some of the representatives of the First Nations at this particular time, so that it isn't about what I might have to say or what the NDP might have to say, but that we are providing voice to the, to the thousands of First Nations people who have uh, been very concerned about this act and have been asking repeatedly for this act to be stopped. We have the words of uh, Treaty 8 Grand Chief who said, quote, that the Sovereignty Act undermines the authority and duty of the sovereign nations that entered into treaty. We have uh, um, the words of uh, Chief Tony Alexis, who is the uh, designated representative on this topic for Treaty 6, who says, let's be honest, this all comes down to land and resources. We are yet again the inconvenient Indians standing in the way of unprotected resource, resource extraction and other extrapolation of treaty lands. We have the words of uh, the uh, Chief Darcy Dixon from Bears Paws First Nations, who says, this is a warning to Canadians. If you care about these lands, if you care about your country, you should care about this bill. It is not a First Nations issue. This impacts us all. Uh, Chief Dixon goes on to say, quote, Bill 1 is just part of a political game. That may be true, but we see it see in it a disguised attempt to disregard treaty and as a way to gain unlawful access to our lands without restrictions. These are the kind of statements that are being made. And today, today we saw uh, chiefs from literally across the country gather at the Assembly of First Nations to talk about this bill and a similar one out of Saskatchewan. And we saw these chiefs who many of whom I've quoted today, and uh, many other chiefs, including the uh, Grand Chief of the uh, Assembly of First Nations, um, uh, Archibald, stand up and say, there is no fix for this bill. That this bill must be withdrawn at this time and stopped. And the primary reason is that there has not been the fulfillment of the legal duty for uh, consultation with First Nations as this is um, going to affect their rights. And, and they're very concerned that this is a, a backdoor way for the province to uh, undermine treaties that have been signed uh, in this country for over a hundred years uh, with the Crown and uh, currently represented by the federal government. And they feel that if this government has the chance, they will rescind the work that has been accomplished by these nations uh, through the courts over the last hundred plus years to ensure and to en enshrine their rights in, both in the Canadian Constitution and in practice every day in this province. There's a lot uh, at stake here in this debate for First Nations. And they are not concerned about this because somehow the NDP have scaremongered. They are intelligent people who have their own ideas and own opinions and, and have access to, this, to significant resources in the legal field. And they have consulted those legal authorities and have determined that this bill is deeply problematic for them. And the primary issue, although there's many issues, the primary issue is the total failure to consult. Now, what would they say if they were being consulted? What they'd say is that we are deeply concerned that our treaty rights are going to be undermined. Now, we know the bill uh, makes the attempt to say it won't undermine treaty rights, but we also know that an analysis that's been done by uh, Olszewski and, and Banks on that 
refers to it as a constitutional fig leaf. That is, it doesn't actually protect the constitutional rights of First Nations people. It just pretends to do so. It hides what happens later in the bill with a statement earlier on in the bill that purports to uh, protect the rights but does not, within a legal framework, protect the rights. So that's where we are. We're at a place where these nations have been working for generations to ensure the well-being of themselves and their future uh, generations, their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, and that this government is finding a way to subvert that. Now, they know that the government says, well, you will continue to be allowed to have hunting and trapping rights, those kind of things that are protected under Section 35 of the Constitution. But they're also concerned about the well-being of the land and the air and the water. They're concerned that the very purpose of this bill is for this government to prevent a federal government from protecting the environment. It's a primary concern that any time the federal government comes in and says, we want to protect these waters, we want to protect these animals, that this government will say, no, we're afraid we're going to lose some money if we do that, so we're not going to do that. That's what... So here we have the chirping from across the floor, where again, they're insulting the chiefs who have specifically said, when you say we only do things because the NDP fearmonger, you're telling us we're too stupid to figure it out for ourselves. That is considered ultimately insulting, and yet it's being repeated in this House minutes after I expressed that opinion by the chiefs. They're not listening. This is proof again that they have failed to listen. They continue to not listen. And the chiefs have said, there is no way forward now because you haven't listened, because you haven't participated in the processes that the courts say you must participate in, then there's no way we can fix this. We have to stop this bill. And that's why I brought in this amendment. This amendment does exactly what it is, what the chiefs from across Canada at the Assembly of First Nations asked us to do today to stand up against this government and say, you are wrong, you have failed, and it is time that you took responsibility for your failure and come back into this House, withdraw this bill, and do so now because you have a duty in the law to consult with First Nations and you have failed to do that. So I, uh, I think we should... We should do exactly that. We should listen to the nations. We should hear them for apparently the very first time in this process of Bill 1 in this House. They haven't been asking for anything that the courts haven't already determined that they have a right to. They aren't asking for anything exceptional or new. It's already been established all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada that they have a right for appropriate consultation. And the very nature of this bill is that it will be used against them. And I can tell you that they're, they're terrified because they know that the last time there was a bill one in this House, in this legislature, under the UCP government, called the bill that was called Protecting Critical Infrastructure Act, that it was designed specifically to attack the ability of First Nations to defend the, their rights, the ones that they had earned in the courts. And the Grand Chief Noski from Treaty 8 has said, we know it was designed only to attack First Nations because it certainly wasn't used when the infrastructure was being blocked on the Coots border by people who are related to... I see the Honourable Member from... Peace River. Peace River. No help. No help. <laughs> uh, Mr. Speaker, I move that we adjourn debate. The Honourable Member from Peace River has moved that we adjourn debate. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, the ayes no. have it. Under Government Motions, Government Motion 15, the Honourable Mr. Scalf.
The Honourable Deputy, the Honourable Government Go House on. Leader. Thank you. Uh, I rise to move Government Motion 15 on the order paper, which reads as follows. Be it resolved that when further consideration of Bill 1, Alberta's sovereignty within a United Canada Act is resumed, not more than one hour shall be allotted to any further consideration of the bill in third reading, at which time every question necessary for the disposal of the bill at this stage shall be put forthwith. Mr. Speaker, through you, uh, to all the members of this chamber, we have had quite a bit of time now discussing Bill 1, and I would think that nobody would argue that point. We are now coming upon 17 hours of debate for this bill. That's plenty of time to get points across and make it clear how you feel about it. Uh, it's interesting, we've known the intent of the members opposite from the very beginning when they chose to not even uh, debate it at all. Uh, voting against it in first reading, something that happens rarely and having, having never happened in the history of our province after a throne speech. Uh, but that is also not surprising, um, given that uh, this morning, as a press conference was held by the members opposite, their key advisor from Ottawa had acknowledged he hadn't read it either. Hadn't even read the amendment. So I'm not sure how someone like that could give any educated opinion on a bill they haven't even seen. Yep. I imagine members opposite, if they had the opportunity, would actually want to debate this bill all the way up until Christmas. That's not the kind of present that I want to give my kids not being there. I would uh, rather do what's best for our burdens, get this bill uh, through this chamber so that we can continue on their uh, duty and continue on their errand. I encourage healthy debate, as it, as it is important, part of this legislature, it's part of our job. But there comes a point when the same message gets repeated over and over, Mr. Speaker, Frank, quite frankly, is a bit disingenuous. And I felt this way from the moment the members opposite voted against it in first reading. First reading. So with that, Mr. Speaker, uh, I will take my seat. Here, here. <coughs> Thank you, Honourable Member. Any members of the opposition wishing to speak? The Honourable Member for Edmonton Northwest. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and certainly, um, again, my comments on the other uh, movements to uh, closure apply to this one again. Um, it's clear that um, this uh, UCP government has created a flagship bill that um, is uh, consistently driving in, in the ditch um, from the very first day that it came out. And here we are several days later, and uh, it's continuing to flounder, not meeting the needs of uh, Albertans. Even considering what the bill purports to do, or try to do, which is to, you know, to stand up to... Uh, federal um, intrusion, it's uh, only through sheer incompetence it fails to do that either. So, you know, really, um, it's, it's, it's best that we clearly air about that because I know what this government's going to try to do now is invoke closure in the, in the middle of the night and then try to uh, re-spin this whole sorry mess into um, something that uh, better suits them when we need to clear the air, clearly. Um, around all of the shortcomings of this bill. The amendments that the Honourable Member from um, Edmonton Rutherford just brought forward is, um, you know, just the latest development that has only been more clearly shone a uh, light on um, with the Assembly of First Nations and um, their um, universal condemnation of both um, this bill and some version of it in Saskatchewan. And uh, people need to know that. And the way by which we do those things is to use the Legislative Assembly. And, uh, you know, part of the criticism of Bill 1 was the subversion of the Legislative Assembly. And so what double, double hypocrisy and uh, irony, that's an irony actually, if, um, of this government is that they would use um, uh, the shutting down of this Assembly to debate a, a bill which would subvert the authority of this Assembly. Right? It just goes on and on. And so, um, in the strongest terms, I would urge all members to not vote for this uh, uh, request for closure. And instead, we will continue uh, with a fulsome debate, starting with the wonderful amendments that uh, the Edmonton, uh, uh, member from Edmonton Rutherford brought forward um, on, uh, on, this, uh, on this bill. Thank you. <clears throat> Honourable Members, having heard the motion by the Honourable Government House Leader, motion, 
Government motion number 15. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say, please say no. No. I believe the ayes have it. And a division has been called. Ring the bells.
Honourable Members, the division has been called on Government Motion 15. All those in favour of the motion, please rise. The Honourable Mr. Shandro, the Honourable Mr. Copping, the Honourable Mr. Guthrie, the Honourable Mr. Dresian, the Honourable Mr. Scow, the Honourable Mr. Madhu, the Honourable Minister Lagrange, the Honourable Mr. Ellis, the Honourable Mr. Wilson, the Honourable Mr. Luan, the Honourable Mr. Jones, Mr. Williams, Mr. Hansen, Mr. Yao, the Honourable Ms. Furr, the Honourable Ms. Pond, the Honourable Mr. Hunter, Ms. Lovely, the Honourable Mr. Yassine, Mr. Rosewell, the Honourable Mr. Jason Nixon, Mr. Reed, Mr. Rain, Mr. Walker, Mr. Churton, Mr. Smith. All those opposed to Government Motion 15. Ms. Sweet, the Honourable Member Phillips, Ms. Goring, Member Irwin, the Honourable Mr. Egan, <coughs> Member Carson, Mr. Dack, the Honourable Mr. Billis, the Honourable Mr. Fian. Mr. Speaker, total for the motion 26, total against 9. That motion is carried and so ordered. Under government bills and orders for third reading, Bill 1, Alberta Sovereignty within a United Canada Act, adjourn debate on amendment, Mr. Williams. Honourable members, are there others on amendment RA1, the honourable member? Uh, seeing none, I am prepared to call the question on the amendment. I'm, I'm having some confusion. Do you want the question on the amendment? On the amendment, RA1, all those in favour, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no. no. In my opinion, the no's have it. That amendment is defeated. We are on third reading of Bill 1. Is there anyone wishing to join the debate? The Honourable Member for Edmonton McClung. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pleased to speak to third reading Bill 1 and the opportunity has uh, been granted to the government side to save their ship by His Majesty's loyal opposition. Uh, this caucus, uh, Mr. Speaker, is is held together by we're not sure what uh, these days, perhaps it's fear of loss, uh, but indeed uh, uh, we have six leadership candidates, uh, uh, five of whom uh, lost and uh, of course the Premier won, so five of those uh, uh, individual leadership candidates who are still in the UCP caucus uh, voted uh, uh, with their voices against the uh, Sovereignty Act as it was being proposed by the Premier during the leadership debate. Yet, uh, after that vociferous and very uh, uh, loud uh, uh, condemnation of the Act here, we have a situation where all five have fallen into line and they're landing, standing up to salute uh, the new leader uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, supporting this uh, version of the uh, Sovereignty Act. Indeed, uh, not much has changed since the first version came out, although there has been a, uh, uh, an attempt to make the bill palatable. Uh, however, uh, Mr. Speaker, I've been uh, uh, watching politics for, for many, many years, and as a youngster, I do even remember watching uh, John George Diefenbaker, then Prime Minister of Canada, Conservative Prime Minister of Canada, staunchly defending uh, one issue or another uh, on black and white television when I was only five or six years old. And I can tell you with certainty from my own watching of, of that man, Mr. Diefenbaker, uh, that he had uh, a very, very devoted uh, uh, love for our parliamentary institutions and would be, I believe, the uh, most staunch defender of those institutions that uh, many of the people in this room, particularly on the Conservative side, might have ever seen. And I believe wholeheartedly that Mr. Diefenbaker would be turning in his grave right now, listening to the type of attacks that we're seeing by the Conservative Party, at least the Conservative Party in name, uh, that sits across from us in this legislature. 
They are seeking to do anything, Mr. Speaker, but conserve our democratic institutions. And further to that, uh, at a time when we are supposedly in this country uh, seeking to fulfill our obligation to uh, address all 96 recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, reconciliation is not what we see from the government with respect to this piece of legislation, their flagship Bill 1. It indeed is a time, Mr. Speaker, when we are discovering thousands upon thousands of graves of children that are being discovered across Canada uh, on lands adjacent to former residential school sites and at a time when we are, are going through this, this, uh, this shuddering uh, time as a nation, we're finding that uh, the government of the day here in Alberta is choosing to forget and turn, all their, turn their back on our obligations, not only under TRC, but in their own provincial, in our own provincial legislation. Uh, and once again, I turn to the own, our own Alberta government website where we're looking at the requirement to consult with First Nations uh, Mr. Speaker, and indeed what's happened is that there has been no consultation and even though the government tries to deny this, that, this explaining that they have spoken a little bit or they're going to speak later to Indigenous organizations, spelled clearly out in our own legislation uh, and the website, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, that their Aboriginal Consultation Office, or ACO, uh, has guidelines, specific guidelines, varied guidelines huge numbers of pages of guidelines on to uh, describing exactly the process for uh, Aboriginal consultation that has to take place under the rules in this province that exist. And yet none of them were followed by this government when it came to bringing forward this Sovereignty Act. And our First Nations chiefs have come forward to protect their rights, uh, which they feel are, are very much under threat. And that's not any surprise, but it is really, really uh, disappointing and shameful that at this point in time in our history, when we're going through uh, a period of recognition of our obligations under the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, when as a nation we're looking at thousands of uh, children's graves being discovered, the, Alberta, uh, the uh, First Nations chiefs are, are unanimous in their opposition to this bill and they're also very uh, uh, upset that they have to go to these extents to, uh, to protect uh, this threat upon their rights that they see embedded in this uh, piece of legislation. And their opposition is being met with dismissive re uh, reactions by the government, where they say, we'll talk about it later, or we'll talk with them tomorrow, we'll, we'll consult uh, afterwards, don't worry, it'll be okay. Well, indeed, Mr. Speaker, our obligation legally, you know, under our own laws in this province, is to consult in advance and have meaningful consultation. And there are other communities, Mr. Speaker, uh, who feel threatened by this legislation. And one that has not been uh, uh, really brought forward, though, is the the francophone community, the communauté francophone, is in the province of Alberta, a grand peur de ce projet de loi, and they fear very much that uh, any legislative uh, uh, gains that they have made in order to promote the French language and French language education in this province uh, are potentially going to be under threat. Should the provincial government decide that indeed they uh, they don't want to support federal government? Uh, 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 directions in uh, francophone education or supporting francophone services in Alberta. So there's great fear in the francophone community that uh, we're hearing about as members of the opposition and that's one thing that uh, we'll be following up with more uh, in, in time to come. But there are so many holes in this boat, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, that uh, we're trying to give the, uh, the government of the day uh, an opportunity to save their, their leaky boat but it doesn't seem as though they're listening. So let's uh, give them an opportunity to take a breath and reload and perhaps uh, think about this for a while. I therefore have an amendment that I'd like to propose. Yeah, if you can grab that for us. And as soon as we have it, we'll have you proceed. <clears throat> I don't know. 
this amendment will be referred to as HA1. If you'd like to go ahead and proceed, you'd be welcome to do so. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'll proceed uh, uh, with the introduction of uh, uh, the amendment uh, brought on behalf of uh, uh, the uh, Honourable uh, uh, Opposition House Leader to move that the motion for third reading of Bill 1, Alberta Sovereignty within a United Canada Act, be amended by deleting all of the words after that and substituting the following. Bill 1, Alberta Sovereignty within a United Canada Act, be not now read a third time, but that it be read a second time this day, six months hence. This, as I said, will offer a, uh, a life preserver to this government to, to save their sinking ship and to perhaps uh, uh, tell Albertans that they've heard them loud and clear and will uh, be able to uh, uh, perhaps completely withdraw this legislation six months hence once they've uh, really gotten their act together within their own caucus and perhaps uh, been able to inform their leader of caucus, the Premier, that they fear for their political lives if indeed decision is made to go forward with this piece of legislation. So I'm not going to speak at length to the amendment. I'll leave that to other uh, members of caucus. Uh, suffice it to say, uh, Mr. Speaker, that uh, uh, I remember times uh, when we were in government and opposition suggested indeed that we should look at something a little more deeply, and there were times when we should have. And this is an opportunity for this government to really Take a, take a good look at what they're doing and perhaps save their, save their, save their leaky ship. And I'd invite them to uh, come up and, and, and speak about the, uh, the amendment we brought forward and uh, hopefully support it to uh, give themselves a, an opportunity to breathe some fresh air and uh, uh, really think about what they're doing in terms of uh, the, uh, uh, the political liability that they're giving themselves and the, uh, the economic uh, damage that they're doing to our province by bringing forward this uh, undemocratic legislation. On Amendment H, A1, the Honourable Member for Edmonton, Beverly Clareview. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I will speak for my full time, and that won't be long enough. Uh, first, I can say to the member from Bonneville, Cold Lake, um, there were times in our government where we did uh, bring in amendments to our own bill, um, and there were times that we admitted when we got it wrong. And that's something that I'm proud of, to have the humility and the ability to be able to do that. I wished the current government would do that. And what I'm about to speak to is my frustration of the members opposite and some of their level of arrogance as to the impact of this bill. Now, I will commend the members opposite. When we were government, there were times that they warned our government of unintended consequences. That's what I'm going to focus on right now, Mr. Speaker. We can go back and forth and name all the different people that have validated the bill or have unvalidated the bill. Great. We can, we can bring forward a list. The problem is this. The unintended consequences of this bill, if it does chase away international investment, I don't want to stand here in six months from now and say, I told you so, because we, we, the province of Alberta, loses. I'm not opposing this bill because I don't think that Alberta should stand up for Alberta. I do. I do not believe from the conversations I've had with international investors that this is the right mechanism. Here's a question for the government. Have you conducted a risk matrix by introducing this bill? Have you introduced a risk matrix? Please don't change the subject. The answer is yes or no. And if you have introduced a risk matrix, then please table it. 
because every company that does business internationally or is thinking about doing business internationally will conduct a, a risk matrix. And my fear and the reason and every reading that I've spoken to this bill and I've spoken against this bill has not been because I don't believe we should stand up for Alberta. Check answered over the last three nights. I agree that we need to stand up for Alberta. I agree that the federal government has at times overreached. I, I appreciate the Deputy Premier is, is chirping. We have stood up for this province time and time again. I, I, I will get the Premier to check the fact that the first pipeline to Tidewater in 50 years is being built because the, the member for Edmonton Strathcona and the former Premier stood up for this province. How many pipelines has your government built to Tidewater? None. Please, please, I have the floor. None. Order. None. Here's the biggest concern, is that for a government that is supposed to be conservative, and I'm saying supposed to be, supposed to be conservative in their risk analysis, my friends on the other side, you are risking the future of Alberta for the next 30 years with this piece of legislation that is to appease 1% of the population. The irony in the fact that this government introduced the most undemocratic, dictatorial piece of legislation. No, 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 please don't come on me. No other government introduced a piece of legislation that allows them to unilaterally change any legislation, statutes, or regulations in the province behind closed doors. If that's not undemocratic, I don't know what is. Well, other than introducing closure. But, of course, when they were opposition, then they cried. And now they're government, it's okay. <laughs> the irony of a member saying, we set the precedent. You're right, because we've been government since 1920. Wait, no, we haven't. No, that was conservative governments who used closure for the last 75 years. The Deputy Premier, order. I will invite you to speak, and I would, I, I'm, I'm happy to get into a, an exchange, sir, through you, Mr. Speaker, of course. So the, the issue I have with this, and, and my frustration, is that members can claim, including Cabinet, that this will not risk future investment. Here's the reality. You don't know that. You don't. This is the challenge with introducing legislation having unintended consequences. The problem is, it may take six months or 12 months before we see the impact of this legislation. But what we've been told, and I get, you don't want to take our word for it, fair enough. The international investors I've spoken to have said that they are looking at other jurisdictions, no longer looking at Alberta. Why? Because Alberta is the only jurisdiction in Canada, outside of Quebec. I'll talk about the impact of Quebec, because believe me, if we want to follow Quebec, let's just follow the headquarters of all of the major financial institutions. And members who have been in the House the last two nights have heard this. All of the major financial institutions had their headquarters in Montreal until Quebec introduced their Sovereignty Act. And then where did they go? They left Quebec. Because they said, we're not about to play by two different sets of rules between the province and the federal government. And they all went to Toronto. Forty plus years later, they're all still in Toronto. They're not moving back to Quebec. 
And Quebec is just now starting to recover from introducing a Sovereignty Act. Now, I appreciate members opposite are saying we're fear-mongering. I'd like to think that what we're doing is trying to provide caution to the government from what we've heard from the international community. And you know what? If we're wrong, and this doesn't impact uh, international investment and investment into Alberta, I'll stand up and apologize. And I'll say I got it wrong. If, if, but here's the problem. If we are right, if inter... The Deputy Premier keeps talking as if he is God or he has some kind of globe that can predict the future. Through you, Mr. Speaker, with all respect, you don't know. And you haven't conducted a risk matrix. If you have, table it. The problem is, if we are correct, and this bill has long-reaching implications of chasing away investment, we will find that out in the long term. But the problem is, the damages will be done. I don't want to stand up and say, we were right. We're cheering for Alberta. The problem is that the risk-reward of introducing the Sovereignty Act, it's not going to do what the government says it's going to do. It's not going to protect Alberta any more than the avenues we already have of going through the courts. And in fact, it's about to risk the hundreds of millions of dollars the federal government's committed to housing, to municipalities, to a number child care, a number of initiatives. If the federal government says, you want to play hardball, Alberta? Great. You get nothing. How are we ahead? We're not. I want to see our province prosper, but I'm worried about this, and I'm worried about this from conversations with international investors. I'm not making this up. The potential downside and risk of this bill far outweighs the benefit, and that's why the opposition has opposed this bill right from the start. Now, I get it was unprecedented for us to vote against first reading. I'm not a favor, I'm not a fan of that tactic, but I can tell you this. We had already heard from international investors when the Premier was talking about a Sovereignty Act months before it was introduced, there was consequences. Companies had said, we're going to put Alberta on pause until we see what's in this Sovereignty Act. That was months before it was introduced. Companies are not going to wait around to make investment decisions. Boards will make their decisions. And if Alberta is deemed risky, they will go somewhere else. And it's already happened. So the fact that now we're about to enshrine a Sovereignty Act into legislation, I will tell you from the investors I've talked to, it doesn't matter what's in it. The fact that you have a bill that tells the globe that the province of Alberta has a different set of rules from the federal government is a disincentive yep. for investment. Yep. It's an additional risk. And for all the business people on that side, and I know that there are several, investments don't like risk. And they will go to the jurisdiction that has the fewest risks and the most certainty. And the reason I'm opposing this bill is it presents risk and uncertainty. And so the problem, friends, as I've said, if I'm wrong, and in a year from now, there has been zero investment flight and zero impact, I'll get up and say that I was wrong. The problem is, if it's true what the investors and the international investment community are telling us, that this will be a disincentive 
then we are putting Alberta at a disadvantage. And I love this province too much to support a bill that could do that. I honestly also don't believe that the bill will deliver what the government thinks it will. And again, I'm happy to have a conversation about what are other mechanisms or tools that Alberta can implement to stand up to the federal government when they overreach. I'm happy to have that conversation. In fact, I think we should bring together several round tables, including members from the business community, and let's, let's talk about that. What can we do? But I also think that politics is all about relationships. And the fact that this bill could have other unintended consequences, like risking committed federal dollars for other programs, including housing and childcare, is valid. We need to be able to deliver for the people that we represent. And I don't think that this bill or that the approach that this UCP government has taken over the past four years has delivered for Albertans. And I mean that sincerely. And as I've stated, I'm happy to sit down and have a conversation on how, how do we deliver? And is there a way for the opposition and the government to agree on initiatives that we can go together to the provincial government to say, you need to do ABC, and here's why. But I cannot support this bill because of the potential risks and implications that come with it. And it, it honestly makes me nervous of where we're going to be in a year from now. And so with that, Mr. Speaker, I urge all members to halt this bill, vote in favour of the hoist. The Honourable Deputy Premier. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, um, I want to uh, very quickly respond to the comment made by the member from... Edmonton Beverly Clairview. Mr. Speaker, I must admit that um, I, I actually appreciate the member from Edmonton Beverly Clairview um, making the comment around that he is now prepared to uh, sit down with those of us on this aisle to think about how we ensure, how we work together to make sure that we prevent the constant attack by the, by the federal government, something we have not heard from the members opposite since I have been in this assembly. Mr. S Mr. Speaker, uh, this bill, Bill 1, came about as a result of the constant, relentless attack on this province's economy, our people, our vital economic interest. And for, for years, the members opposite, rather than to side with Albertans, have always sided with their friends at the federal liberal government and now their federal NDP leader, Jagmeet Singh. Mr. Speaker, this is at the root of why we have gathered in this assembly tonight and to make sure that we have a tool that will allow the government of Alberta to say to the federal government, you can't be relentlessly attacking our vital economic interests and our people's overall well-being and expect us not to respond. Mr. Speaker, we saw that from between 2015 and 2019 when the members opposite were in, in office, in government. Mr. Speaker, they imposed a multi-billion of billions of dollars in carbon tax that they did not even bother to run on. They did not tell Albertans that they were going to impose a multi-billion 
billions of dollars in carbon tax. And the people of Alberta, I, I recall, I wasn't in this chamber then, Mr. Speaker, but I recall the people of Alberta protesting that decision. In fact, it is their decisions, Mr. Speaker, of the members opposite that ultimately led me into politics. I did not envision running for public office until the members opposite formed government in 2015. And then they began their attack on our economy. And they refused to listen to the people of Alberta. They pursued policies that undermine our exceptional economic advantage to the point where Alberta was nearly on its knees. Mr. Speaker, here are the facts. By the time they were done with Alberta, 183,000 of our fellow citizens were out of work. They brought in that carbon tax that made everything so expensive and made life less affordable for the ordinary guy. Mr. Speaker, they ran deficit for every single year in the billions of dollars that they were in office. They took our debt, the entire provincial government debt, from $13.9 billion to over $70 billion in short order. Mr. Speaker, before the firm government, we were spending a couple of $100 million to service the provincial government debt, all of our debt. By the time they were done with our but we were spending $2.2 billion to service the provincial government debt. Mr. Speaker, that is $2.2 billion we could have invested in education, in health care, in social services. Instead, we were paying out the, the, those interests to bond masters who were not even in this country. They, they are headquartered in Tokyo, in New York, in Paris, and in Beijing. Mr. Speaker, those of us on this side of the aisle will prefer to spend the, that $2.2 billion on our people right here at home to develop our communities. Mr. Speaker, they didn't end there. We were constantly being, being downgraded by the rating agencies. They befriended Justin Trudeau and claimed that they were going to buy social license to be able to protect our economy instead. We got Bill C-69, the so-called no more pipeline bill. We got Bill C-48 that singularly targeted Alberta's bitumen. Mr. Speaker, we then got the carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, Alberta was under attack. Federal legislation after federal legislation by the, by the Trudeau federal government were being imposed and rammed through against Alberta's economic interest. Our people were crying, pleading with the opposition to work to defend Alberta. They lifted no finger. Mr. Speaker, and then we not have, in my view, in my humble view, the worst environment minister in Canadian history, a radical who wants to end the, the largest sector of the Canadian economy, the oil and gas sector. Mr. Speaker, there were rallies by the members opposite across our province with radicals that wanted to, to end fossil fuel. There were photographs of members opposite. I have been uh, personally part of a, a point of order in this assembly as a member with respect to the use of the word radical and directing it at other members of the assembly. And I would encourage the Deputy Premier to make other choices. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I was referring to the, the, the Federal Environment Minister, not to the members opposite. So, Mr. Speaker, we are now at the point where Alberta, as a province, as a people, must defend this province's vital economic interest. Hence, this critical bill. That is exactly what this bill is meant to accomplish. Nothing more, nothing else. 
And Mr. Speaker, this amendment, HA1, put forward by the members opposite, would essentially say this bill should not proceed. Mr. Speaker, that is shameful. On one hand, the members opposite, finally, at least I want to give credit to the member for, from Beverly Clairview for acknowledging that there is need for us to come together to protect our province and our people. But it is too late. And rather than them put forward on how they think we can make this bill better, achieve that, their intention is to ensure we have no tool whatsoever to be able to say to the federal government, it got to stay in your lane. They don't want to do that because that is not their interest. It has never been their interest. Otherwise, at this moment in time, in our history, when we have rising inflation, high cost of living, at the rate we have never seen in decades, you would think that their first order of business would be to call on their federal NDP leader to work with the, his friend Justin Trudeau to end the carbon tax or to put forward measures that will ensure that the people of this country are not being hammered by their policies. That is not the case, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, the answer is no. The bill as crafted with, with the amendment that, that has been made before the floor of this House achieves that, provides that tool for us to be able to say no to the federal government. And, Mr. Speaker, I also heard you know, argument that this would, this violate treaty right pursuant to section 35 of the Constitution. Nothing could be further from the truth. To the contrary, Mr. Speaker, this bill in section 2 makes it clear that the treaty right enshrined in our Constitution is preserved. It is there in black and white. And rather than the member, members oppose it, to stand with us to inform our Britons and to speak with our First Nation communities that there's nothing in this bill that impairs their treaty and Aboriginal right. They have been fear mongering. And Mr. Speaker, let me say a word or two to our First Nation communities. You know, I have had the honor of serving in four different ministries. I've, I've worked closely with them. I value them, and this government valued that strategic relationship. And in my time that I served in those ministers, I have carefully listened to them and worked with them to move forward their agenda. There is nothing in Bill 1 to the member from Edmonton Highland Norwood, there's nothing in Bill 1 that impairs their treaty and Aboriginal right, and it is hard time you, you stop fear-mongering. This divisive politics needs to come to an end at some point for the sake of our, our, our province. So, Mr. S Mr. Speaker, you know, um, many people here don't know, I often don't talk about my own, my own um, history, because our First Nation communities are so dear to my heart the chiefs, because my own parents, both my mom and daddy, are also Aboriginal chiefs from where I come from. And so I understand the issues that they confront and they deal with, and all of us must have an interest in making sure that we work with them to confront them. And so I want to say once again to them, I, we hear their concerns. We hear their desire to for, for us to work with them. But the bill currently being debated in this House, in the most respectful manner, take into consideration the need to protect and preserve their Aboriginal and treaty right. And this government will continue to dialogue with them, work with them to ensure economic opportunity in a manner that furthers true reconciliation. With that, Mr. Speaker, I urge uh, all members of this assembly 
uh, to vote on this proposed amendment. Are there others? The Honourable Member for Lethbridge West. Uh, thank yeah. you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, uh, rise uh, to provide a few comments on uh, why this uh, uh, bill uh, ought not uh, to be considered uh, by this House at this time. Um, we have had a number of conversations in the media and elsewhere. We've seen uh, many, many people weighed in on the risks uh, to our investment climate, certainly, our economic future, our economic resilience. Um, and uh, there is no question, Mr. Speaker, that part of that is because it represents a full-throated uh, attack on the stabilizing principles of liberal democracy, namely uh, separation of powers and uh, primacy of the judiciary. It's useful to consider why the centerpiece of this legislation is actually to have this legislature act as uh, to take the, the role of the judiciary. Um, and uh, I, I have indicated that certainly when one consults uh, the architects of the Free Alberta Strategy, one sees uh, uh, that it's uh, a politicization of the federal judiciary, a distrust of the judiciary, and a, uh, uh, it is a feature, not a bug, a, a, an, a, um, a coordinated political attack on the role of the judiciary and their independence. Now, here's the thing. Why? Why is that there? And why is this Sovereignty Act essentially indistinguishable from what was campaigned on and uh, what is contained in the Free Alberta Strategy? In fact, it was quite interesting to me that there wasn't a pivot, as was widely anticipated a week uh, or eight days ago. Uh, a number of people uh, had, had begun to comfort themselves out in the investment uh, community and so on that uh, uh, perhaps the, um, the province, given the deep unpopularity of the legislation and uh, the fact that uh, we know that uh, the government and uh, the various leadership candidates uh, are heard loud and clear from the business community that uh, this uh, sort of misadventure was in fact a, a, a deeply problematic, uh, destabilizing um, proposal coming from the now Premier. If we examine the words of the Free Alberta Strategy and uh, uh, the architects of it, uh, architects is actually a, 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 the people who wrote things down in a, uh, a legal document that makes Rudy Giuliani look like a, uh, a, 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 a legal scholar. Um, Barry Cooper, June 21st, 2022, says, uh, 2020, June 21st, 2022, whew, um, uh, uh, writes that the uh, Free Alberta Strategy and the Sovereignty Act in particular was meant to be unconstitutional. Um, because what can flow then from the passage of a Sovereignty Act, whereby the legislature takes up the role of the judi judiciary, um, is the following. Here's what they can then do. Interim measures uh, are things like getting rid of the RCMB, an Alberta pension plan, Alberta unemployment insurance, a new Alberta banking law, and opting out of federal programs that interfere with provincial jurisdiction, chiefly in the areas of health, education, resources, and environment. All of those uh, aspects are, in fact, enabled, emboldened by this act. Yep. Then Mr. Cooper goes further. Uh, other measures that flow from the passage of a Sovereignty Act require the passage of this Act in order to get to uh, uh, the following. Replacing Canada in negotiated international trade agreements, ensuring all judicial appointments in the province are made by Alberta, which is a clear Section 96 uh, uh, violation of the Constitution right there. Expanding and enhancing Alberta's financial institutions to protect Alberta business. So, in other words, uh, uh, just simply violating the Bank Act, I guess. Um, and uh, enabling this Alberta Revenue Agency to divert taxes uh, from the federal treasury to Alberta and uh, granting immunity from federal enforcement through the Canada Revenue Agency. I am struggling to think of any business that would want to invest in a place where you don't know 
if there are health and education transfers, infrastructure transfers, what the banking laws are, where you're going to remit your taxes, and how much. Given that the Sovereignty Act is virtually indistinguishable from the Free Alberta Strategy, and the Free Alberta Strategy authors have indicated that this is the next step, it is no wonder that we have heard from business loud and clear. They need to know what the rules of the road are. The public, I think, has come to accept that politics permeates and saturates most of life now. And uh, there are fewer and fewer areas, slivers within that Venn diagram upon which, po uh, uh, in a polarized political environment, that uh, uh, political parties can come to agreement. But I think Canadians and uh, Albertans do not accept that what's right and wrong is political. It's not. I don't think that Albertans accept that this idea that there are, isn't just one set of rules for everyone. I don't think that people think that there's room for politics in that. I don't think that Albertans think that the, the idea that we can just politicize the judiciary, usurp their role, undermine the authority of the courts, undermine basic rules of trade and commerce, of banking, taxation. I don't think Albertans believe those things are political. They're not uh, up to the feckless inclinations of an unelected leader. I don't think that Albertans or Canadians, uh, but certainly Albertans, expect that we politicize the basic traffic signals of our democracy. We just don't. These stabilizing principles are what give us the good life. I have said this many times. They're uh, what give us uh, uh, equality, dignity of the person, individual liberty. They are what uh, governs our, our uh, property rights, transactions, trade and commerce. They are what uh, uh, governs scientific advance, development of knowledge, dissemination of knowledge, widespread literacy even. They are the, the, it is the type of society that has allowed for people of working class background whose parents never went to university to come and uh, you know, I, I achieve a couple of university degrees and then stand in a legislature um, and uh, I, I represent their constituents for now almost the end of two terms. They are the, the foundation of who we are. And they're also the foundation of who we are going to be. Because this is ultimately a fool's errand that will be stopped in its track. By Albertans. It already has been. They, they didn't even need to see. The reason why we voted against Bill 1, or uh, sorry, first reading on Bill 1, was because we had already heard that it had driven out investment. We had already heard from Albertans that they were entirely uninterested in this uh, uh, particular caper. They were, they had rejected, in fact, and they were, they agreed with the now Minister of Finance, who called it an economic time bomb. They agreed with the current jobs minister who called it a fairy tale. They agreed with the now municipal affairs minister who called it anarchy and the minister of trade who said it was like shooting ourselves in the foot. We shall see in the coming weeks from the publicly available uh, uh, data that comes out just how much more Albertans agree. We already know that over 60% of Calgarians do not think that this is an appropriate way for the provincial government to be spending their time. I have heard over and over again and a number of, of excuses made, uh, uh, chiefly among them this idea that we should be more like Quebec. Oh, Quebec gets to do these things? Why not us? Well, when the Parti Québécois began these ridiculous misadventures of separating from Canada and so on and so forth, Hundreds of thousands of people left the province of Quebec. There was a capital flight 
unlike anything we've ever seen in the history of the country. And it is only very recently, in the last four or five years, that the Quebec has returned to stable economic growth. They have had uh, uh, some, some very uh, re uh, good news coming out of, in particular, the city of Montreal in terms of attracting new investment uh, and uh, uh, new industries, economic diversification, and so on. And it is only since they essentially left behind the fractious politics of federalist versus sovereigntist that had dominated the landscape for so long, and Legault made himself a, co a coalition of center-right parties, essentially, with the sole goal of moving beyond the cul-de-sac that the sovereigntists and separatists had, had driven the province into for the previous 40 years. And they took power and they re-won it. And the Parti Québécois is, I, I want to say, they're, they're the third party, I'm pretty sure. And they compete with the, um, the Quebec Solidaire after the last election, it was in September, I think, um, uh, uh, for like fourth party status. They are barely a ripple in Quebec politics anymore. But it took that long. It took that long. And meanwhile, as my, uh, my honorable friend uh, I indicated earlier, the capital flight was staggering. It would be impressive if it wasn't so depressing for the people of Quebec and so destabilizing to the Canadian economy more generally. So we don't need that. I'm, not, I'm pretty sure we don't want to replicate that. Or where you even look at the economic performance between Alberta and Quebec, per capita GDP and so on, I'm pretty sure we don't want that, because that would mean a reduction in our standard of living here in Alberta. We don't want to be like Quebec in those ways. I don't think you think what you think you think. What we do want is to create a resilient economy for the future, where we welcome investment, where we can quite easily say, yes, the Bank Act, Act applies here, and when you pay your taxes, you know where it's going to go. <laughs> when you put in a Water Act permit, you know what's going to happen. If you're an oil sands operator, you know what the future of the Joint Oil Sands Monitoring Agreement uh, uh, looks like. You understand your obligations under both navigable, water, navigable waters, federal species at risk, and the Lower Athabasca Regional Plan, both federal and provincial. The rules are clear. The expectations are obvious, and the investment climate is stable. The only way we get there is by rejecting this hot mess bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable the Premier has risen. Oh. Well, thank you. We actually moved the bill, or the third reading was moved on your behalf, which means you've actually already spoken, so my apologies. Oh. Uh, you're unable to speak to the bill. The Honourable Member for Edmonton West Ende. Well, what a delightful surprise, uh, Mr. Speaker, to be able to uh, likely uh, wrap up our final opportunity to uh, speak to this absolutely terrible piece of legislation, Mr. Speaker. And uh, if somebody just wants to send me a note if I need to. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have had the opportunity to sit through the majority of this uh, debate on the Job Killing Sovereignty Act Bill 1 that this uh, government put forward, a flagship. Uh, my apologies. Oh. <laughs> we're on the hoist. Uh, because we're on the hoist, this is possible. If we were on uh, the actual reading, we wouldn't be allowed. She has five minutes. Uh, or whatever time she would like to take. That's my error. Uh, but thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I uh, hope I can get everything in in uh, in five minutes. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, I understand that the members opposite have been trying to derail any discussion of this bill from the beginning. They didn't want to. They didn't even want to read it when it was first introduced. They voted against it on first reading. Then they asked the. Uh, the Prime Minister to weigh in and revoke the bill, denied, of course, doing that, because I, I, I think they understand why it no. is that people reacted yeah, so, that. so badly in asking for the federal government to come in and interfere in our jurisdiction, because that is exactly what they and their party leader at the federal level has been enabling with the coalition they have in Ottawa for the last number of years. And when, when they, I find it so remarkable that they've been talking about investment flight, capital flight, 
saying that it has been on, on that this it, that they're projecting that there would be unprecedented capital flight. Well, it'd be hard to beat because there was unprecedented capital flight when they brought through the climate leadership plan, and that was once again partnering with our enemies who want to shut down our industry to try in some flawed way to get appeasement with Ottawa. And I don't know why it is they felt that they needed to suck up to Ottawa. It's not like Ottawa is a national government. As a, the way our country works is that we are a federation of sovereign independent jurisdictions. They are one in, of those signatories to the Constitution, and the, the rest of us are signatories to the Constitution and have a right to exercise our sovereign powers in our own area of jurisdiction. The problem that we've seen over the last number of years, and when I talk about the loss of investment that occurred because of this failed attempt at, at trying to chase after federal approval, the Climate Leadership Plan brought in a carbon tax, which, uh, when it, when, uh, three aspects, carbon tax, phase out of coal, and an emissions cap. And one of the things that occurred, of course, was Northern Gateway ended up getting cancelled, cheered along by the members opposite. They never supported Northern Gateway, which would have uh, but done so much to help advance our economy. Energy East, once again, also got shut down with, uh, with no support from the opposition. Uh, Coke Oil announced that they had two oil sands projects that they, uh, that they walked away from because of the uncertainty being created by the, the Climate Leadership Plan. Uh, the, uh, we also had the Key Pills plant. It, was, it had been operation, a coal plant, been operation uh, for just six months when the actions of the members opposite forced it to shut down. We still have uncertainty in the electricity industry and in creating new generation as a result of those decisions. I was just meeting with a group of, uh, of energy leaders in the retail side yesterday talking about how we, uh, in the future, after 2035, it's uncertain how we're going to develop new, uh, d new, new uh, natural gas plants because of the new requirements being brought in at the federal level. This is again a violation of our provincial jurisdiction. And then, of course, Western feedlots also shut down. They only reopened uh, when, the, when the UCP formed government again. In the year after they got elected, there were 7,200 businesses that shut down. That's what capital flight looks like. And it was caused by the actions of the members opposite. So really, they should spare me any discussion about how much they care about the investment climate. Yeah, because yeah. if they cared about the investment climate, they wouldn't have started this track in the first place. And the reason this track is con continuing is because their coalition at the federal level, and this is part of the reason why they keep on trotting out Ottawa-based pundits to support their view, because this is the way they think the country ought to work, is that Ottawa ought to come in and tell us how to run our own affairs. The members on this side feel the opposite. And it's because yeah, of hit yeah. after hit after hit that we have taken as a result of the process they started. Bill C-48, a tanker ban on the West Coast that is designed strictly to landlock Alberta's bitumen, came in under their watch, Bill C-69, which is an historic invasion of provincial jurisdiction. We already have a court judgment telling us so. We have 10 provinces on board with fighting it because they inserted themselves into every area of provincial jurisdiction when it comes to creating projects. Any power plant, more than 200 megawatts, has to be approved by the federal government. Any stretch of highway, 75 kilometers long, has to be approved by the federal government. Anything that they determine is federal jurisdiction, even if it's 100% within our borders, they can intercede and tell sorry, you can't build that. That is such a violation of provincial jurisdiction. When you look at the, the fact that we had a, an equalization referendum, 62% of Albertans voted in favor of pushing back against Ottawa. What, and, and, and I think that was, only, that was only one aspect of us trying to start a conversation so that we could get a fair deal out of Ottawa. After we did the fair deal panel all across the province, what did we get instead? We got Environment Minister Stephen Gubbo, and what has he done since he got into the position of environment minister. Has he come with an, an open hand and say, hey, let's work together. Let's try to find ways that we can export more LNG. Let's find ways that we can work on carbon technology. Let's find a way that we can develop the hydrogen economy. Let's work together on getting more of your resources to market. No, the exact opposite. He, he, he announced an edict that we were going to be moving to a, a, an electricity grid that does not allow for uh, any fossil fuel based power to be on that grid after 2035. We've got 90% uh, 
of our electricity in this province is generated by natural gas and the cost associated in this short period of time of trying to develop new power with, uh, with, carbon, with carbon technology and carbon capture just in such a short period of time to enable more of that development, it's, it's, th this is too short a time frame to be able to achieve that. What's going to happen when we hit 2035 and they're now telling us we can't build power plants? When we talk about as well, they came in and said you, we're not going, they want to phase out combustion engine vehicles so no more can be sold after 2035. That, that's only 13 years away. What are, on the, in the world do they think is going to happen? Have the members opposite even talked to anybody about the impact it would have? What it is that we need to have to increase the capacity of our electricity uh, grid to be able to accommodate? Or, order, order. The Honourable Member Fred Rutherford will come to order. The Premier has the call. Have they even talked to anybody in the electricity business about what it would cost to upgrade the power grid in order to put more, to put 100 percent plug-in vehicles on the road by 2035? I was in Wainwright and I talked to somebody who wanted to put two, two Teslas in his home. It would have cost $20,000 to upgrade the electricity system just to plug in those two vehicles. Our current electricity Sir. system only allows for us to have six vehicles on a single block plugged in before all of a sudden we have to do massive, uh, a massive investment in our power grid. Are they even, and how are we going to do that if the federal government is dictating to us that we're not allowed to add new power? They also began the just... Order. The Honourable Premier. They also began uh, the just transition report, a, a task force. What is the just transition? Well, when it was applied to coal workers, a just transition coal workers completely out of work. They want to have a just transition, as they call it, of oil and natural gas workers completely out of the business as well. This was also started at the federal level. In addition, what have we seen? As we were going through our leadership contest, they announced that they wanted to have an emissions cap on fertilizer of 30%. They put a warning label on beef, for heaven's sakes. It was only because of massive pushback on the industry that they finally uh, relented on that and realized that they had to consult more. They've announced an emissions cap just prior to our leadership race even being over. We're right in the middle of choosing a new premier. And on September 30th, they put forward a policy consultation to put an emissions cap on our oil and natural gas emissions that would reduce emissions 42% by 2030, right in the middle of our leadership contest. What disrespect for our process here. It isn't even their area of jurisdiction. And now, of course, our member from Bonneville, Cold Lake, has, has spoken eloquently as well about this. I hesitate to interrupt, and I do apologize to the Premier for uh, neglecting to recall that we were on the hoist amendment uh, at the beginning of her remarks. But, pursuant to Standing Order 15, the time allotted for this debate has concluded. And I am... Order! 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 I am required to put all questions to the Assembly to dispose of the items before the Assembly with respect to third reading of Bill 1, Alberta Sovereignty Within, Canada, within a United Canada Act. On the amendment, HA1, as proposed by the Honourable Member for Edmonton Decor, on behalf of the Honourable Official Opposition House Leader. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. No! my opinion, the no's have it. That motion is defeated and a division has been called. Call in the members.
Honorable members, a division has been called on Amendment HA1. All those in favor of the amendment, please rise. Oh, I just... <laughs> Ms. Sweet, the Honorable Member Phillips, Member Irwin, Member Carson, Mr. Dack, the Honorable Mr. Billis, the Honorable Mr. Fian. All those in opposed, please rise. The Honorable Ms. Smith, the Honorable Mr. Shandro, the Honorable Mr. Copping, the Honorable Mr. Lowen, the Honorable Mr. Guthrie, the Honorable Mr. Drusian, the Honorable Mr. Scow, the Honorable Mr. Madu, the Honorable Minister Lagrange, the Honorable Mr. Ellis, the Honorable Mr. Wilson, the, Hon the Honorable Mr. Luan, the Honorable Mr. Jones, Mr. Williams, Mr. Hansen, Mr. Yao, the Honorable Ms. Fur, the Honorable Ms. Pawn, the Honorable Mr. Hunter, Ms. Lovely, the Honorable Mr. Yassine, Mr. Rosewell, the Honorable Mr. Jason Nixon, Mr. Rain, Mr. Walker, Mr. Churchin, Mr. Smith. Mr. Speaker, total for the amendment seven, total against 27. Motion is defeated. Honorable members, on third reading of Bill 1, the Alberta Sovereignty Within a United Canada Act, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. No. In my opinion, the ayes have it. That motion is carried, and so order, and a division has been called. Call in the members.
A division has been called on third reading of Bill 1. All those in favor, please rise. The Honorable Ms. Smith, the Honorable Mr. Shandro, the Honorable Mr. Copping, the Honorable Mr. Lowen, the Honorable Mr. Guthrie, the Honorable Mr. Dresian, the Honorable Mr. Scow, the Honorable Mr. Madu, the Honorable Minister LaGrange, the Honorable Mr. Ellis, the Honorable Mr. Wilson, the Honorable Mr. Luan, the Honorable Mr. Jones, Mr. Williams, Mr. Hansen, Mr. Yao, the Honorable Ms. Fur, the Honorable Ms. Pond, the Honorable Mr. Hunter, Ms. Lovely, the Honorable Mr. Yassin, Mr. Rosewell, the Honorable Mr. Jason Nixon, Mr. Rain, Mr. Walker, Mr. Turton, Mr. Smith. All those opposed, please rise. Ms. Sweet, the Honorable Member Phillips, Member Irwin, <coughs> Member Carson, Mr. Dack, the Honorable Mr. Billis, the Honorable Mr. Fian. Mr. Speaker, total for the motion 27, total against 7. Motion is carried and so ordered. <laughs> The Honorable the Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think a lot of great work has been accomplished this evening. I'd like to uh, congratulate all members of the Government Caucus and the Premier on the passage of Bill 1. And I uh, look forward to doing more great work on behalf of Albertans. But at this time, I move that, we, uh, that the Assembly adjourn until tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. Honorable members, having heard the motion as proposed by the Government House Leader to adjourn debate, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. no. In my opinion, the ayes have it. That motion is carried and so ordered. And the House stands adjourned until this afternoon at 1.30 p.m. Order.